Good morning, everybody. It's such a, uh, such a lovely acoustic in here that I can actually hear uh, you all muttering. So please, um, please mutter away. What we, uh, I, I'll just start by saying what we want this to be is a very interactive, um, very interactive morning and for those staying for the, for the afternoon briefing and the more technical bits, we want it to be as interactive as possible because um, I know that some of you will have uh, read the early documentation and the more recent documentation that's gone out and noticed subtle evolutions of them between the two. And I think it's fair to say that this is going to be uh, a process that's going to evolve further uh, as we go on. Not that I'm suggesting that we're moving the goalposts in any way, but what we do want to do is use these briefing sessions that we're doing to gather questions, respond to them, and help shape the propositions. So once we've done the briefing, uh, that isn't the end of the story, and the AHRC team know that after this, the hard work begins, which is responding to, to the things you want. So uh, I'm Andrew Chitty. I'm the uh, AHRC's Creative Economy Champion. Um, I'm trying to get used to putting Professor in front of my name, which the best thing about that, as far as I can see so far, is that some online companies offer it as a drop-down. And uh, it's really, re I really like those companies that do now. Um, but the main thing for me is I've only been working in an academic context full-time. Uh, since the start of this year. So before that, I uh, worked as a television producer, interactive producer, uh, founded a couple of businesses um, in, in uh, digital production and in digital health. Um, so I'm very much a... I don't know if post turn gamekeeper is the right word, because I'm not sure academics are gamekeepers for industry. Um, but certainly, I, I've moved across the fence. I've done quite a lot of R&D projects with universities uh, and collaborative R&D projects, um, both in, in, in the creative sector and, and in the health sector. So I try, uh, I do think I can understand the difficulties that we've set uh, in, in, in this proposition, which is um, the hard thing of delivering relationships and partnerships between industry and academic institutions or research-led institutions that have impact. And I think this is something we'll come back to probably throughout the day, um, is what do we mean by impact? Um, what we don't mean by impact is just research outputs. What we mean is real outputs on the sector. And perhaps to explain that, I was just going to um, open up by talking a little bit about the origins uh, of this, of this programme. So Creative Industries Clusters programme. Um, originated as a capital bid from the Arts and Humanities Research Council into the Treasury. So the idea being that following the work that the HRC had done establishing the knowledge exchange, forward knowledge exchange hubs uh, in the creative industries, um, it became clear that the idea that industry, creative industries thrive when they're in a cluster, when they're heavily networked together, and there could be a research uh, relationship with that, seemed a very interesting one. But it was at that stage primarily an arts and humanities led bid um, it still is, but the evolution uh, from that stage about a year ago, where some of you may have been at some consultation events, uh, to now, and the big change has been the industrial strategy. So um, I think what the industrial strategy did was, for one thing, take all other options off the table, uh, but the other was to try and establish uh, two things. One is uh, industrial strategies to reinforce and drive forward key sectors of the UK economy, which is still, to some, I think, in Whitehall, an uncomfortable idea, although it's one that certainly the last time I worked in government 10 years ago was bubbling to the surface then. Um, it's a particularly hard one, I think, to, uh, to fight for the creative industries in that mode. Um, lots of people recognise the creative industries are an important part of the economy, um, but the they are also cacophonous and difficult, you can't get the eight people from the automotive sector in the room and uh, develop a, an industrial strategy for businesses ranging from ceramicists to film companies. Um, so the industrial strategy has become the context for this. Uh, and we've developed through that and trying to keep the creative industries both in the industrial strategy and in the research components of the industrial strategy 
the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. I'll come, when I do the briefing, I'll talk a little bit about what, uh, about what that means. But the Challenge Fund, as I understand it, and there are probably people in the room who understand it a lot better than I do, but as I understand it, the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund is essentially an R&D war chest for Brexit, is one way of thinking about it. So this is a one-off uplift in the R&D budget, or as our ministers are often call it, the science budget. We're the non-science bit in the science budget. Um, but I think that that understanding both of those things, so the, uh, the role of this in, 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 government, uh, in government policy, so a one-off R&D fund to, to protect and promote certain key sectors, and also that it's an R&D fund conceived, however we want to, uh, however we feel about this, it's an R&D fund conceived from the point of view of those more classically led uh, uh, classical science and technology <laughs> sectors, so we have to think about R&D, will be helpful for everybody in trying, to, um, in trying to prepare their bids. Now, the other thing is, um, lots of people will know, so the Edge Office made several uh, kind of investments in this area in the past, or what seemed to be at this area. So obviously North East Fuse is one of those that's ongoing, it's very important to the HRC, and very pertinent to uh, to this proposition because it brings together the, the STEM subjects and fuses them with the arts and humanities subjects. But the other one is the KE hubs, the knowledge exchange hubs. And um, I think one of the interesting things that people will be asking, particularly if they were involved in any of those, as people uh, you know, uh, uh, around the country were, even though they had four core locations, is, is this more of the same? And I think the really important message to that is no, it's not more of the same. It absolutely is not more of the same. The KE hubs were very important and I think uh, moved the conversation on for ways of re academic researchers working with businesses to develop new ways of working. They also developed some lots and lots of very, very interesting projects. So I think they stand uh, in very good stead as examples of ways you might want to work. But the, thing, the problems that the KE hubs lacked was scale. So one of the key things here is, whereas the KE hubs looked at small-scale projects, which were incredibly innovative and really insightful, if you look across the, the, the range of things the KE hubs did, you'll find lots of similar small-scale projects done through different hubs. That's not the objective here. I think the other thing was, the KE hubs were fantastically successful in engaging SMEs uh, in different ways. They were not so successful at engaging large corporates. And whilst it is absolutely true that the creative industries is dominated by SMEs and particularly micro businesses and has a large freelance population, to think that that's all there is to the creative industries, I think, uh, is, a, is a mistake. Um, these SMEs need connectivity with um, large companies who have access to global markets and large companies that, that have supply chains so that they can grow. So I think one, one of the things um, that we should be looking for and we are looking for in trying to get some national partners for this programme is an interaction between, between smaller companies and larger companies. And I think an interesting example is this the work that Creative England have been doing in what they call big guy, little guy partnerships. So taking large corporates uh, in the creative sector, creative and digital sectors, and, uh, and introducing them to a range of SMEs. So the SMEs get access to supply chain, uh, knowledge distribution, uh, and the large corporates uh, get access to innovation, fleet of foot, uh, little companies, and talent. So I think that's a, that's, a, that's a real objective for this. I think the other bit of context that I put around this is, um, is at the moment that the, the, the challenge fund of which the, from which this program is funded, um, it comes at a funny time for, for, for the research infrastructure. So this project's led by the AHRC. Uh, we just closed a call, which some people in the room I know, thank you, have submitted for around uh, immersive part, uh, development funds, um, which we've done with, which is AHRC, EPSRC. We're doing some other things in the industrial strategy, which are EPSRC, AHRC, and Innovate UK. So at the moment, these are all, there's the research councils, there's Innovate, there's bits of Hefke. By this time next year, by the time this get, gets underway, these will all be brought together within UKRI under the leadership of Smart Walpert. 
And I think the world will look like a different place then. And I hope it will, particularly from the point of view of the creative industries and the creative economy. Because that sector has been an absolute priority for the AHRC for um, what's now quite a long time, since Rick Rylance was chief executive. And it's been driven forward by Andrew Thompson. I think the important thing going forwards is the creative economy and the creative industries within that is not the sole preserve of a single research council. Obviously, the Arts and Humanities Research Council feels that it has a very strong understanding of it because the creative disciplines in terms of research sit within uh, AHRC's orbit. But the technology aspects of that are funded uh, by, uh, by EPSRC and the businesses are funded by Innovate. So as we go forward, what I would hope is that we can position the creative industries and, and the wider creative economy as an example of how these research councils and organisations that are currently separate can work together. I think there's good evidence that we can do some of that, and there's equally good evidence that we've got some challenges along the way, particularly between research uh, uh, funding and, and business funding. But I really think that as the organisations move to work together within UKRI, the creative industries, creative economy, digital economy, all slightly different things, <laughs> Um, could benefit from everybody being within one organisation because this is a core area for the UK and to divide it between these different, uh, these different funding groups doesn't help us. So that's all I wanted to say as a kind of introduction. Um, uh, I should say, of course, this is... A, though we are in Gateshead, uh, we're not confined today to conversations about the northeast as a region. Obviously, we have people, for, uh, we have people from... Uh, from Yorkshire and from further afield uh, here, uh, we'll pursue, I think, probably uh, in different ways, the idea of what the clusters are across that, across that geography and what the partnerships are. Um, so we're going to start with Herb Kim giving us a keynote, which I hope will be provocative. A lot of you all know Herb. Um, and I think that Herb's, Herb's uh, knowledge of industry not and the sector and the dynamics of businesses that are emerging across not just the northeast but a huge sway of the north all the way across to to the Wirral um, will will be enormously insightful and start to position us where we need to go for the rest of the day, which is what is this about? Uh, what is this program trying to do about partnering between uh, industry and universities? We're then going. I'll then do a briefing, which will be the technical bit. I'll be joined by my colleague Dylan Law from the HRC. So we'll brief on the actual um, on the on the actual competition that we're inviting you to bid for, uh, and we'll take some questions after that. There'll also be a technical session, as we know, this afternoon. Um, if we get repetitive, it may be because we're not very good at doing presentations. But I'd like you to entertain the idea that if we're getting repetitive, there's a point to it. Because we really, some, of, some of the messages uh, we know uh, for aren't, uh, we, we want them to come across very strongly so you don't uh, waste effort uh, putting together partnerships that aren't quite what we're looking for. We then have a panel which responds to that, and perhaps takes out some of, the, uh, some of the thinking around that, around what makes a cluster, what makes a city cluster, um, how do businesses interact with this? How could businesses uh, benefit from this? Around particular, perhaps some particular questions around sectors. Is this, is this art and design or is this technology? Those kind of questions. And also what does this mean in terms of uh, marrying with uh, economic development? But we're going to start off with Herb. So Herb, please take a stand and, and, and feel free to provoke. Okay, I'll do my best. Um, morning, everyone. Uh, I've got something like 25 minutes for my keynote, and then, and then luckily there's 10 minutes afterwards uh, for Andrew and I to have a bit of discussion and Q&A. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bias. The, I have many questions about this program. I'm sure you do as well. But I'm going to bias that block of time towards the Q&A bit and keep my, my remarks relatively short. Um, I thought I'd just start with just a bit of background about me, maybe why I'm here on stage, what got me to, uh, to appear before you this morning. So, uh, some background. Uh, so, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm originally from the US, not from the northeast of England, but from the northeast of America. I came uh, to uh, England in 1997. 
I'm sure many of you recognize uh, that town. Uh, and I came to, uh, in 1997, to go work for Blackwell's. Again, I'm sure a name that would be very familiar to many people in the room, uh, to help set up their internet bookshop. Uh, this is now, yeah, 1997, just as Amazon.com started to become a thing well known in the book trade. Uh, and um, my last job in uh, the South, uh, I didn't realize I was in the South till I came here, but um, uh, was working for O2 um, uh, between Slough and Ealing. And I was about to take a job at Orange when my best friend uh, at O2, was a Geordie fellow, convinced me to take a look at this unusual opportunity that was being set up here in the Northeast. And it was to set up uh, something uh, that became known as Codeworks. Uh, and uh, very in summary, uh, so, so back in 2002, it was a not-for-profit economic development company. It was both funded by central government uh, and uh, the EU, and uh, at a high level that set up to hothouse the digital technology and media sec sectors for the future of the Northeast economy. So why did I, so what, one of the things that, that, that I ended up, I mean, it was, a, it was a really left field thing for me to do given what my background was before that. Um, but one of the things that really captured my fancy was this idea, the, the, for those of you who may, may remember at the time, there were four other centers of excellence set up. So mine was the digital technology media one, there was one around uh, chemical processes, another one on biotechnology, another one on uh, nanotechnology, uh, we had a venture capital focused one, uh, and they were all basically, oh, well, there was a new, renewable, renew and renewable energy one as well. And they were all very capital intensive uh, ones. And for me, um, what I saw, uh, I, what I sensed was uh, the value of, of clustering and networking as being something that was hugely important. And that you know, if, if you live in a place like New York or London, then finding clusters of creative talent or digital talent is pretty easy. Uh, you, you know, the, you know, there was all sorts of networking going on. It was, it was not a difficult thing to do. Uh, my sense was in the north that this was a, a was a much more difficult thing, especially back in if you cast your mind back to 2002. Uh, and the Homebrew Computer Club, as some of you will doubt, undoubtedly know, was where Steve Jobs and Wozniak met, and obviously went on to found the small venture called Apple. Um, around that time, some of you may also remember something called the Cambridge MIT Institute, uh, which was a, I think a Gordon Brown project, uh, which also had a, a healthy whack of funding behind it. Uh, and as part of that program, I got invited to go to Cambridge, uh, sorry, yeah, Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, in, I think it was 2002, late 2002. Um, I got asked to sit in for a colleague uh, in a lecture that was being given by a woman named Fiona Murray, uh, who I believe is still there. She's an economist, originally from Scotland. And um, what was fascinating to me uh, about her talk was to some extent, she was giving some evidence about the value of creative clustering, right? And what she talked about specifically was the biotech industry, which for her is a creative industry, uh, in this, in, 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 well, certainly a knowledge-intensive industry. And what she talked about was she compared three different parts of the world, uh, the greater Boston area, uh, the UK, and uh, one area of Germany, whose what region of Germany, whose name escapes me. But uh, the reason they picked those three areas is because they all were receiving Relative, about the same level of, of federal funding for research. Uh, and you won't be surprised here that uh, the great Boston area uh, had, was doing a much better job than the others at exploiting that money into actual commercial output. Uh, and uh, to cut a long story short, what she made the argument around was that the thing that Boston did better than those others was have active soft networks, right? And so the reason the soft networks were so important was because, you know, of course in the UK we have people that have come out of, bio, that have a, you know, that might have some biotechnology that they want to exploit. Same thing in Germany, and same thing in Boston. And, and then they will come and do the presentation to a venture capitalist or a bank or whoever it might be. Uh, and the thing that Boston had was all these soft networks that would allow people, so you come, so I, let's, just, let's assume me, I come in, do my pitch to someone, and now that person can now go and pick up the phone to someone that might be at MIT and say, I've just heard a pitch from this Herb Kim character. Is he any good? You know, uh, is, he, is he easy to work with? Is he, you know, so on and so forth sort of thing. And it was lots of these little interactions that were, were the kind of the grease that made uh, Silicon Valley, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Greater Boston work uh, as a biotechnology hub. Uh, so that was a very conveniently timed thing. 
for me to learn about. I brought that into a lot into our work that we did here, which was going to be a very effectively network intensive approach towards uh, our work. Uh, we got involved in a number of UK and European research funding bids. We were again successful. Uh, we started spinning, helping companies spin out, uh, both in the university as well as the private sector. Uh, we started a network uh, that uh, was called Coworks Connect. It was inherited from actually University of Sunderland, who started originally as a digital media network. And we helped grow that uh, quite successfully. Um, and there's the twist in this part of the story, because around 2005, our funding agency, One Northeast, as I'm sure some of you will remember them, uh, they had everyone from their chair down through the chief executive and all the leading directors, they were all effectively replaced. It was a kind of quiet coup d'etat. And um, as, as you'll undoubtedly know, when new management comes into place, they like to change things, right? They like to do things differently. And um, I was speaking to uh, Andrew and uh, to Sam before, uh, about the challenge for the creative industries traditionally has been it's something that, uh, particularly central government and things like that, hasn't really figure, figured out how they could kind of help it along, if you will. Uh, and I think oftentimes suffered to being seen as a bit lightweight and, and not, not hefty about some, some perhaps other parallel sectors. And so these new characters came in and they concluded that digital was not going to become an not be an important part of the future of the Northeast economy, at least they told me. Uh, and as such, they, um, they, uh, they came into our board meeting in February 2005 and informed me that they were planning to shut down the company immediately, and, uh, which was quite shocking, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, we survived. I won't go into all the details in the backroom politicking they went into, but we survived. We got to start, earned a state of execution. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, as part of that deal, we, had, we suffered through massive funding cuts, and our targets were massively increased. Um, I think very smartly assuming that we would just simply either die quickly or go away uh, quietly. And um, so in response to that, uh, we obviously were really searching for some big ideas about how do we deal with the challenge while staying true to the mission of what we wanted to do, which is how, you know, how do we, we clearly weren't communicating well enough the, the importance of, of this creative digital sector for the future of the Northeast. What could we do? Uh, I went on a bit of an, uh, I suppose, crash course uh, in trying to figure out something. I read a book at the time called Good to Great, uh, which I won't, I, won't, I won't go into great detail about, other than it, 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 it in my summary, it asked you to do three things. Figure out what you're really passionate about, which for us was easy. We were really passionate about digital technology media. We really believed in its future for not just for the Northeast, but for the UK more generally. Uh, secondly, you know, what are you unusually good at? You know, be brutally honest. What are you unusually good at? Uh, we happen to be really good at this networking and, and, and all these activities associated around it, particularly conferencing and things like that. Uh, and then find an economic model wrap around that. Um, around the same time, I read about a conference that's now quite famous, but at the time was relatively obscure, called, uh, called the TED Conference. Uh, I managed to find a way to get an invitation to uh, TED 2006, which at the time was in Monterey, California. Uh, and came back inspired with our big idea. This was going to be our big idea to, uh, uh, to help save what we were trying to do, uh, plus meet the, the mission of what we were set up to do. We were going to call it Geordie Ted, and uh, the Ted people never replied to that email, so instead <laughs> we uh, called it Thinking Digital, was the, the, was the name that we, we came up with. Uh, interestingly, it wasn't, as you may remember in the, early in the story, my company was called Codeworks. Uh, and the, the original proposal was going to be something like the Codeworks Technology Summit or something like that. Uh, but my board was so afraid of this idea, they said, you cannot put the company name in this conference, Herb. You want to name something different, so if this thing sinks like, like the big ship we think it's going to sink is, sink as, uh, it'll just be you that goes with it. Uh, he didn't say anything exactly those words, but you know, that was, that was kind of thing. And I have to say, uh, the, uh, it, it did not go well for in the first year. A, a, a lot of our a brave talk about good to great in the TED conference quickly became about survival and saving face. Uh, we, uh, we, we do get there in the end, uh, we, we, it's, uh, but it's, it's quite a challenging uh, event for us. We don't have much choice but to go again for 2009, and we launched 2009. And then, the, of course, the beginning of the global financial crisis began which meant that our two biggest sponsors from the year before uh, pulled out. Uh, and uh, we, were, we were definitely stressing out at that stage. But uh, luckily, um, things 
uh, improved with time. And we clung on there, and uh, by 2010, uh, things are going very, very well. People, people are getting the concept. Uh, we make it into the uh, top 100 for Wired uh, and, and Media Guardian. Uh, unfortunately, another crisis besets us, if you will. Uh, the coalition government gets elected into power in 2010, which uh, one of their first acts was to shut down the RDAs, uh, which meant the end of uh, the, the, the financial support there. Um, we tried to keep the company going for about 18 months, but it's just too difficult. So uh, I decide that I'm going to sell my house in Liverpool and buy Thinking Digital from from my old company, Set of Thinking Digital Limited, which is which is my company today, which we started in 2012. And fortunately, we're still here. We still exist. Uh, we just celebrate our 10th anniversary uh, just this past May, um, and things are going well there. We're doing now other events, uh, picking up on the TED theme, as you know, after we launched Thinking Digital, the TEDx program is coming. I'm sure many of you have been to or have at least heard of, uh, of, of local TEDx events, and we now do the TEDx events uh, across the north. Uh, this is a new event we're doing uh, in Liverpool called the Binary Festival. Uh, and some of you will know that uh, I uh, helped to create and am now uh, currently uh, chairing the board of an organization called Tech North. Uh, which, uh, again, uh, attempting to develop, I guess, our digital clusters across the north, amongst other things. Uh, and uh, also more locally, working with an organization called Digital Union, which was the old Coverse Connect, which is now part of Generator, uh, which is the uh, music, the, the, the music uh, economic development uh, company that uh, Jim Motsley runs. Uh, he's, he recently, or probably about a year ago now, required Digital Union, and we're working with him uh, as well. So, creative clusters. Um, you know, uh, I, upon the, I, I know this has been relatively late breaking news. Uh, I mean, for me, hopefully, what comes across here is I've been a long time advocate of creative clusters, uh, and, and I've been, I mean, I very much, uh, I, I, to some extent, my life's work has become around helping them along in a small way. I, you know, my, what I do is is just a one tiny uh, piece of the puzzle. Um, Obviously, it's great news for, for the UK creative industries uh, that the central government is trying to do something at all and something pretty big is, is fantastic news. So that's really exciting and, 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 and great to hear about. Uh, but the devil's in the detail. And um, hopefully you can see some of this sort of stuff. And so some concerns that I have, and I realize, again, things are developing quickly. Um, in the messaging, the focus seems to be on money uh, and not ambition. And... What I think about is, you know, JFK called to put a man on the moon, not to spend 20 billion on rockets. And so um, I, I, would, I would love to see more messaging around what this program seeks to do to, to, to change, uh, I suppose, the arc of, of the UK creative clusters and economy. Um, I would say that, again, in my experience with, and this is true for all large organizations, uh, but certainly government programs is that, uh, I mean, this is great to see, this roadshow. Uh, I realize it has a specific purpose to obviously develop applications uh, and consortia quickly. Uh, but just around that messaging and communication is so critical, particularly if you want to engage private sector. Uh, I, I was speaking to Andrew before, so I was relieved to hear um, his, his insights on this. But really, I guess, investing in, in recruiting and developing the ideas and the partnerships. Um, this is, I mean, to some extent, if this is a one-time deal coming out of Brexit, then we have one big opportunity to really push the ball, kick the ball for, you know, far down the field. Uh, I, I guess being, having been involved in public sector for a while, oftentimes there does seem to be just a pressure to develop projects that will tick enough boxes and get approved. Um, and just to spend the money because it's there. Uh, I, I, I would certainly hope, um, and, and I'm, I'm increasingly confident that, that, that Andrew and others will push to ensure that we get some really fantastic projects um, and, and, and consortia. Um, I, I would also hope as well that the funds go perhaps more towards achieving results and less towards paying uh, university staff and overhead. No offense to university colleagues here, but uh, it, uh, a lot of these, a lot of this money. While 80 million on one hand sounds like a lot, it can go quickly um, and just sort of di disappear into uh, the ether and into the machinery. 
One of the things while picking up on uh, the Theon Murray stuff is that I, I, I hope that there is a lot of active communication collaboration within and between the eight hubs that, uh, that, that these, 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 these projects, these initiatives almost become you know, vital networks in and of themselves, uh, you know, in addition to obviously what they seek to uh, develop and to innovate on. And so that's me. Those are, those, are, those are some of my reactions and thoughts to what I've read and seen so far. I um, hope it's been of some interest. Uh, and Andrew, shall we, shall we, shall we chat? Oh. <laughs> Hello, have a seat. Um, that's, I think that's in incredibly enlightening on a number, number of levels, because in a way, as you started out with CodeWorks as a, as a kind of deliberate kind of cluster building yeah. organisation. Yeah. And then what you've turned into effectively as a business, your, your career and your business, it is, is clustering as a business. Yeah, so it's kind of it's kind of interesting evolution, isn't it? When you think about what we're what we're trying to do in terms of, um, is it about making deliberate interventions? What are the core deliberate interventions? Where have they already happened, and then where can we add value? Yeah, yeah, sure, well, sure. I mean, so for myself, I mean, uh, I think that's to some because I think you also talk about sustainability as the other thing as well. So um, we we began with obviously wanting to achieve a public duty aim around. Supporting cluster and cluster development, and so and really uh, to some extent, almost proving the argument because at the time, there, one of the problems that we had was it wasn't apparent there was a cluster to be developed there, right? Especially up here. Uh, you know, for me, luckily, I happen to really enjoy what I do. So um, there's that there's that combination. Um, we do it well enough that it's, it's what I would call self-sustainable, hardly hugely profitable. Uh, and hopefully contributing its own, you know, continue to contribute toward the development of those creative clusters. Yeah, so that, that leads me on to one, one of your questions, and I think in one of the, uh, one of the messages that perhaps is in, in the call that we've put out, is um, what we've made the decision to do here is, is, is to, where we want to put this money mm -hmm. is to test what, if you inject additional R&D funding into existing clusters, mm -hmm. What can happen, yeah. and in a way, that sense, the you know, is this a one-off shot? I think um, it is probably the first time that um, UK government has put this scale of R and D funding into into the creative sector. Mm -hmm. And to be quite honest, our biggest worry is we can't afford to cock it up because otherwise, we won't we won't get it again. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the question then is that you say is how do we, with that intention, get fantastic projects? Rather than good solid, yeah. Well, I think tick box. The first question, which one of your colleagues addressed before uh, we, we got on stage, was around is because I guess it, is it being funded by Bez? By yes. Bez, by, or however by it's pronounced. Bayes, I believe. Bayes. Bayes. Which is, is a business enterprise. Enterprise industrial strategy. Industrial strategy, right? So it's it, it's interesting that it's being funded, I guess, from a department that's that's I guess to support business that's obviously going through AHRC and going through universities. Yeah, uh, and so there's a concern as to whether or not now typically I guess research funding goes towards publishing and these sorts of good academic yeah. outputs. Yeah, uh, but this is weird because you're also trying to achieve I guess an economic aim, and, and between the balance between there is is there a clear emphasis on one or the other? Yeah, it's on the first one, not the second one. So with this, this, the emphasis here is on. Uh, Long, medium and long term economic impact okay not on not on uh, the normal standards of what, what, what people in the stream would call referable okay. uh, research outputs okay all right I think that's uh, you know I think we it's, it's, it's good to bring that out mm -hmm. are we absolutely entirely sure how that works not really I okay. don't think uh, because it is a move both for the research community and for the research council away from business as usual yeah. But that's what we're interested in. And that's where I think the, the, the key comes about this thing that you raise about fantastic projects you know, and things people are passionate about. How do, we, how do you think we can encourage people to think like that? Um, I, mean, I think one thing would be just what are examples of this historically happening where you know, the, the, by, by funding 
by funding through universities and, and, and R&D uh, areas that, that collaborations with the private sector have then led to some great stuff. Um, so to some extent, because it's, you know, it, it, is a, it is kind of like boldly going where no research council has gone before type stuff, right? And, and so to some extent, the, the, more that, the more that we can kind of illuminate what that might look like, um, the better, I mean. Yeah, I mean, it may be, um, it may be that it's not so much going, but about, I'm always, the, you know, the splitting infinitive thing is always going to be a problem in a room full of academics. <laughs> Um, but the boulder going where no research council has come before, another way of looking at it is boulder going where some of the other research councils have been for a long time. Okay. Which is identifying a kind of uh, the, whatever the analogue is of, 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 of core research, you know, underpinning research that drives future value. Now, it won't be the same in the creative sector as it is in healthcare or medicine. Okay. But, it's, but it may be, that's one way of looking at it. Okay. I think. Now, in your previous, so this is, is this the fourth stop on your current road show? This is, no, yeah, this is, yeah. This is, this is event four, yeah. Yeah, cool. So um, are you finding that uh, accessing the private sector is more challenging than the university sector for <clears throat> thus far? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and I say that as someone who, who, who uh, knows less about the, the, yeah. the, the, the academic sector in many ways. Uh, yeah, it has, and I think there's two, there's two kind of levels to that. One is, I think we've got a desire that these are, and it will come through in the briefing later, is there are, there are guidelines and there's a scope set from the top, mm -hmm. but the details all have to come from underneath because these have to be real partnerships. So there's a bit about engaging uh, the private sector that are part of the clusters that are bidding. Okay. So that's quite, that actually is a research council. It's quite a hard job mm -hmm. because the research council's main connectivity is with, with the universities. What we are hoping is that the universities that are best placed to, to lead or, or be at the heart of these bids have that network of industry. Okay. And we're asking them to prove it mm -hmm. as part of the application process. So that's a key point of evidence, is if you haven't got an industry partnership to bring with you, yeah. that's not going to look right. Um, I think the other side of it is, as I was saying, uh, the, the, the KE hubs, the HLC funded work, very good at engaging tiny businesses mm -hmm. or small micro businesses. And lots of really, really fascinating work. Um, it's quite hard for to, to spot sustainable, impactful, long-term relationships between researchers and big creative industries, businesses. You know, so big bits of the advertising sector, big bits of the broadcasting sector. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to engage those on a national scale. Mm -hmm. So let's go. Uh, that, so that's myself and Anthony Lilly's job is to go out and make those relationships mm -hmm. and then bring them together with the with with the, the bids as they emerge. Okay. So if we get to a kind of shortlisting stage, then we'll have a bunch of companies that, perhaps bigger companies, and that's perhaps more efficient than everybody trying to chase the right person at YouTube, yeah. uh, because uh, you know it's it's like Geordie Ted, that's the mail that never gets answered. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we talked a little bit before about, and I don't know if you want to go into detail about this, but uh, an immersive technology possible proposal going forward. And, and without going to, I guess my question that we didn't get to, that I didn't get to ask you would be around, what, what would you hope to come, like, you know, it gets, let's, you know, it gets funded and what's, what, is there a sense of what the dream is off the, off the, off all this stuff? Or, um, I think it's, I think this is where it gets really tricky about setting a, kind of trying to set a balance, trying to get a balance. This is, this, this is, the, this is great. I, like Sorry, the, apology, like apologies. Apologies. No. Um, no, it's good because because I think the the, the 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 cons that you raise are the most interesting things. You know, it's those questions. So somebody asked me the other day, do, do we do we want a serious games bid? Do we want a design bid? Do we want this? And it'd be great if we had great bids that were very focused like that. Mm -hmm. I, there's no question in my mind that would be a good thing. I think focus is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's us for people to tell people what the focus is. Mm -hmm. I think if we issued a list saying we wanted, we wanted cluster, you know, R and D partnerships, which is what the what the things are called. Do we want R and D partnerships focusing on these things? Mm -hmm. If we do that, that goes against the idea of it being from the strengths of the existing clusters. So the dream is that in the various. Uh, creative clusters, mm -hmm. people get together and say, this is what our challenges are. These are the ones that we can address in R&D. That's mm -hmm. what we're going to focus on. And then tell us why that's the right thing. Okay. 
So it's cool. so it's, so it's it's trying to identify. Sure. It is that you know. Yeah. I'm going to nick the line about not spending money on rockets because I think that's uh, <laughs> that, I think that's a very very pertinent. Yeah. So so long I guess long term ultimately the hope that this R and D partnership would yield economic competitive advantage that would allow that regional or national cluster to 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 grow. To build, yeah. To grow. to grow to get stronger to attract new businesses into it to attract you know maybe move to the next stage of, of kind of critical mass. And, mm -hmm. and it is through doing R&D. That's the key. It's, yeah. it, is, it is through R&D. Yeah. And what are, so what are the, what are, so it's eight, it's eight, so it's roughly, is it 10 million pounds per thingy? Uh, per, Something like that, per yes. consortium? Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, it's we're, there's a, we're offering the opportunity that they are of variable size. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, one knows that everybody will immediately bid for the, what they perceive as the maximum. Yeah, of course. Irrespective, yeah. and, and, mm -hmm. and there might be one who departs and goes, Kind of uh, a little bit agile. Over how, how, how many years? Uh, so that's over five years. Five or so. Okay. So yeah. So yeah. there's a there's one of the things we might get questions on later on is that the various numbers attached to this program that seem to be very, very varied, and that's because the industrial strategy has a lifetime of three and a half years. Okay. But that's that's just because it does. Yeah. So five years is a more is a more sensible figure. And is this the um, first like industrial strategy thing to actually be? Because I've mean, been talking about the industrial strategy for a while. Is this the first? Uh, well, so I think thing? I think the interesting thing is it took people for quite a while to realize that there was a conversation around the industrial strategy going on over here, mm -hmm. and then there was this thing called the industrial strategy challenge fund, which actually had money. Right. So the the message that's kind of been coming out of government is particularly around the creative industries yeah. sector deal is is there's no money, yeah. no new money. Meanwhile, there was this 4.8 4, 4 billion pounds over here. <laughs> and believe me, the engineers and the medics in the automotive industry did spot that difference. Yeah. So, so the early announcements have all been We're around those. in those areas. Okay. And, and at one point there were, because the idea that, you know, within, uh, I suppose within kind of where R&D meets kind of mainstream economics, that everybody's very excited these days about challenges. Everything has to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. So there was this whole process around what are the challenges, mm -hmm. and at, the, at one point there were ten areas that were subject for challenges, and they're all things like space. Yeah, you know, back to the split infinitives. Um, but there was space, and there was there was biotech, and there were lots around automotive and the transition to e-vehicles and things. Mm -hmm. And then there was this thing about that there was these extra two which were smart cities and the creative industries. You know, okay. as, as you say, the creative industries are just a challenge for government. Whether mm. Uh, and, and they were on the list, and they were off the list, and you know, all over Christmas and, and, and right into January. Creative industries kept going back on the list and kept being kicked off the list, and it ended up as 10 plus 1, right. which was the creative industry. And then it was trying to work out what would the R&D framework that government works to accept as a legitimate question about the creative industries. Okay. And of course, the tendency is it defaults down to technology, okay. which we've been trying to fight. But when when they did the consultation on the industrial strategy, clusters came out as number one every time. Didn't matter how they asked the questions, right. um, that it came out as the no, as Pretty the number sure. one challenge. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that that's the thing that Peter Bazalgette picked up in his review mm. and why it's so big on clusters is it's the one thing. It's yeah. kind of you. I often find we, in some of these events we've had uh, economic and cultural geographers along going, you know, God, we've known this for twenty years. This is so obvious. Yeah. Perhaps that's just how long it takes to get into policy. Yeah. Um, from academia. I think because it's just seen to be kind of hazy, it's, you know, it's not, it's not we have to build a building or we need to build a <laughs> 50 million pound R&D center or something. So at the, uh, at, the very, that's, that, at the very start of that, the world's question came back down from the upper base saying, could this just not be one center that we could open Right. You know, like Daresbury or something like right. that. So you'd have this one centre on a greenfield site that would solve all the problems of creative industry. And I think it was our job to go, particularly those of us who worked in industry, yeah. to go back and say, no, yeah. not really. Yeah. That makes a good photo opportunity, but you end up with <laughs> an empty building five years hence. With, Interesting. Which you have to keep funding. So, can I, sorry, may I ask? No, no, sorry, no, carry on. Yeah. I'm, it, it's because you're the you know, since you're the you're the you're, if you were the, <laughs> one of the arch, chief architects of this thing, it's a, it's a great opportunity to be able to to to, to query. Uh, for the proposals that are you looking for them to be based on strengths of industry clusters? Is that the is that the leading point or research strengths within universities? Or I mean, I'm sure. I mean, wouldn't it be both, great? Well, right? ideally, yeah. wouldn't it be great if they mapped onto each other? Okay. Um, and I think in some so I think there's no doubt what we're trying to encourage is one of the objectives is closer relationships between research and industry 
in a cluster. Okay. Because otherwise, if the research is separate from the cluster, then it's not doing the clustering thing of bumping into people and having those casual sure. conversations that two years hence set up a great, great business. And okay. so I think, um, I mean, I was talking to um, Professor Dave Ball down in Bristol, who's a, who's a you know, kind of IEEE type, yeah. hardcore, hardcore coder. And he said the most useful thing about the whole of the Bristol cluster was the last Friday events that Dick Penny runs at the Water Show, which are basically open drinks from five o'clock. Yeah. He says he's met people through that, that if he deliberately tried to meet them, wouldn't, it would have taken years. Yeah. So Dave Sproxton and Armin. So you get an engineering professor and somebody who runs an animation business. There's, but if, if you're in the same environment and the same group of people, then you bump into each other and then you get hawking and then yeah. kind of good stuff comes out of that. And so I think that's, um, I think that's another element of clusters is, is organ what's, the, what's the current incarnation of organisations like Cobrex, so the Actors Hub, that, that bring people together in a neutral yeah. space? So it's not yeah. just dragging industry into universities or practitioners into universities. It's not just dragging researchers yeah. into businesses. It, yeah. It's somewhere where you can all hang out. And we used to run a commercial business before, and, and you'll no doubt remember the difference between trying to get in to pitch someone face-to-face -face through yeah. effectively a formal way Absolutely. versus running into them at a, at a conference. Yeah, yeah, you it know. took me years yeah. to work that out, to be honest. But yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a, that, that informal... That, that, yeah. I think it's just a, that sense of building up what people are about, what their objectives are, and their wherefore, therefore where they align, rather than hitting it straight on, in a, as you say, across Completely. the table. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that's important. Yeah, cool, okay, good. Uh, any other questions? Right. Um, what, are, what are my other concerns? You've got, so, you've got results, not overheads. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good yeah. message. Yeah. Really good message. Yeah. How do you think you can, how, how should we deliver that? Uh, I guess challenge the applicants to really, for things that, that go into the application that are effectively paying for, whether it be university overheads or staff, that they're really needed. Um, that, you know, ultimately, think of yourself as a venture capitalist, right? And you would challenge your fundee as to, you know, where, where, where is your money going to be spent and why? Um, and I think if it's possible to, to, to take some level of rigor there to ensure that this program really is getting the most bang for buck, um, it's, and, and it may well be that it needs to all, you know, most of it will go, go to it. I'm not, I'm not like anti-university. No, 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 at all. no, but it's, it's an issue. It's, so do you think we really should behave like a, a VC or an investor? Do you think we should, do you think we should release funds at the start, uh, in tranches, do you think you know? Do you think we should um, set kind of proof points? I, if you, why not? All right. I mean, you're trying to achieve economic aims uh, and things like that, and so why not make it more challenging that way, more commercial in, it, in, it, in, it, in its makeup, so that you can also make sure that ultimately you're getting. You know, if this is a if this is a one shot deal, then you know, without I mean, of course, you know, without being ridiculously onerous, just as a venture capitalist would not yeah. sit in on every management <clears throat> meeting and respect daily reports and things like that, right? You know, so it's just how how does the management of this fund, if you will, you know? Yeah. So actually, think about it as management. I think that's really interesting. That's a discussion that that we've had as what is appropriate. I think there's a thing about this being not business issues. This is not impinging on other AHRC yeah. core funding. This is, a, yeah. this is a new thing. Um, and when I say it's a one-shot deal, um, obviously, we think it's the first, it's the first time that this is... Yeah. That we've had our sector yeah. vary with the others. It's not like there won't ever be any yeah. medica, medical research well, funding. But we want to... Funds, exactly. Right? Yeah. We want to keep it uh, yeah. on there. That's why we can't... Definitely. Um, and I'm just going to come back, kind of finally, to this thing about ambition. So mm -hmm. you know clusters across... Right across the span of the north, and you know the you know you know the south as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering if there's things that immediately spring to your mind out of strengths uh, mm -hmm. out of some of those clusters where the research and the industry does sit very yeah. closely aligned. So okay. wh where would you where so, would you encourage people to? I mean, so you mentioned immersive already, and it's, yeah. it's definitely something I'd say that uh, the northeast has uh, done pretty well on, uh, as well as the northwest. Um, in terms of just the amount of industry that we have, of companies dealing uh, in that sector. Uh, Gates said here have made an investment in something called Vertigo, which is an a, a industry network that's done 
actually quite well, and they're now uh, about to open up a new building called Proto, which again is going to feature immersive as, as a, it's part of the digital catapult network that, right. that they're trying yep. to build as well. Um, uh, the Northwest doesn't have anything equivalent as far as I know, but it does have, it has, there's something called VR Manchester, which has yep. some, supposedly something like 800 members or something like that, you know, so pretty active sort of the stuff, that, stuff going on, on on that space as well. Um, again, I'm speaking mostly from the digital tech side. Yep, yep. Um, the Northwest is also really uh, quite big in e-commerce. So you've got big firms like ShopDirect, uh, AO, Azos, and, and others, uh, the Hut Group, uh, that have all got big e-commerce presences, uh, in, well, uh, headquartered a lot in the Northwest. So that's an area that's, that's coming. Uh, the Northeast has surprisingly got a lot of fintech-related stuff. Mm -hmm. um, between Sage, Virgin Money, uh, Scott Logic, uh, a Performance Horizon Group, and others like it uh, that are all basically in that financial services uh, tech space. Um, the leads in Yorkshire are really big in things like health data, mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, definitely yep. a, a an, area, an area of focus for them going forward as well. So uh, those are some that I guess off the top of my head that, that, that pop out that would be areas that I would be looking to see if there is the stuff to be built around that. Okay. I, think, I, I mean, I think they're really fascinating. They're, they're, they're fascinating suggestions because they take us into an area where, where it's the intersection between the creative and digital economies is a, is a, is a really, really interesting space. Mm. And what those kind of uh, creative disciplines add in value mm -hmm. to 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 uh, fintech or retail, or I think so is is a really really interesting um, interesting area for us. And mm -hmm. and if there are real assets there, I mean, a lot of those are based on kind of core, almost like anchor tenants, aren't they? That within yeah. the industry sector, yeah. and then yeah, which um, I think would it's unfortunate that you have such short period of time to do because that that would be one thing that would be great to be able to to develop some of these consortia and to engage because some of the folks that I mentioned it'll take a while just to kind of get them yep. to the table if you will to talk about you know some of these some of these areas but you know I realize life's not always perfect I, it's, <laughs> no it's not I mean I think there's a there's, there's, there's lots of reasons why uh, that a different timeline for this program would be yeah. ideal but yeah. um, a different timeline with no money is not much fun yeah so we're just gonna Fair have enough. to uh, gonna have to kind of cope with uh, with the timeline that we've got okay um I'm going to say very, very big thank you to Herb there. Um, Thanks for having me. Probably more, help, hopefully more insight come out of Herb asking me questions than what I'm going to tell you. Uh, <laughs> as well as I think, I think the things that Herb's saying there about um, those sectors that have got influence, I think, and got traction, which is important. Um, I think the thing about ambition, so shaping up these proposals so that they're, they're fantastic projects not just groups of people, is absolutely core cool to. Um, so that was a really great start to our morning. And thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Hello, welcome back. Um, so well, now we're going to, we, we're going to brief you on, on the competition. So as, um, I'm assuming that a lot of people will have read the competition documentation. So the intention here is not to run through it, but rather to try and draw some of the important themes out of it. So I'll run through a, a, a briefing, and uh, then Dylan Law will join me, because I have to have a minder when it comes to questions, because I don't um, really know how we're supposed to do things. Um, about So we can then deal with... Questions about objectives and scope and uh, some of the perhaps technical questions, although we can take those into the afternoon session as well. So, um, creative clusters. I thought I'd talk a little bit about clusters and about how we got to this um, idea and therefore what the, we mean by clusters, perhaps in, 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 in contrast to, to other people. So, um, the context obviously is, um, is the industrial strategy industrial strategy overall, but particularly the industrial strategy challenge fund. So challenge fund becomes an important part of this. So it is the vogue within government to construct things, to think the right way to construct uh, R&D strategies is around challenges. So that means identifying a problem or a need to sharpen the mind. And I think uh, we, we're, we're very keen that that is a strong element uh, of this program. Um, 
The first few announcements from the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, as I touched on earlier, were, were in what you might think of as traditionally strong uh, R&D fields. I think uh, Herb's talk was, uh, Herb referred to the idea that the creative industries are a little bit woolly and fluffy, and what you really want, proper, proper jobs and proper R&D, is, like, is, is widgets and big things made out of widgets. So the first um, announcement from the Challenge Fund, there's, a, there's been several around automotive, uh, and there will be more, I'm sure, but particularly around uh, the transition to e-vehicles and uh, with the Faraday Challenge around batteries. Um, there's a challenge specifically around uh, autonomous and remotely piloted vehicles in dangerous environments, for which I read the oil and gas industries. Um, and there has been um, an initial challenge, and I expect there will be more in wave two, around the life sciences. So these are very kind of traditional, hardcore, uh, fundamental research to applied research, to research and development, uh, to commercial exploitation, um, built on the kind of model that we're used to in the, uh, in the life sciences, the medical health sector, uh, in engineering uh, and in technology. But until, um, until recently, it was nothing about our fabulous creative industries. Uh, and I think one of the problems there, as I might have touched on earlier, is that though the argument that the creative industries are important is not one you have to fight in policymaking circles that much anymore. It's very rare to find uh, people who would oppose that. You know, if you've got a sector that is the fastest growing in the economy, both in terms of GVA and of employment, then people finally do take notice. But government does find it difficult to talk to the creative industries. But the argument that it need, that, that our sector, the creative industry sector, needs research in the same way that the life sciences do, uh, and that will feed forward into future value, or needs research in the same way that engineering or manufacturing do. That argument isn't one, and that's the argument basically we've been having for the last six, eight months uh, to, to try and uh, establish that. So um, when I say relatively recently, so obviously we have been preparing this for quite a while, but in fact the official announcement of the programme was only a fortnight last Friday uh, by Greg Clark um, at the Bazaljet Review. The launch of the Bazaljet Review, uh, which, which some people in the room may, may, have, may have been at, um, Baz came out with his independent report on the creative industries, really focusing on clusters as the main mechanism. And, um, and Greg Clark positioned this program as part of the government's response to the Bazaljet Review. Now, We've worked very closely with uh, the team at DCMS supporting Baz in his report, but that isn't quite the case. So this actually predates a lot of Baz's uh, conclusions. And the important thing is that whilst we're really, really happy to align with everything that Baz said, we are not a pilot for what Baz recommended because Baz recommended a whole approach to a very all-embracing and comprehensive policy approach to clusters. So he suggested a 500 million pound cluster fund that looks at emerging clusters, uh, building clusters, that looks at access to finance and aligning all those things. And what we're doing, although it's called the Creative Industries Clusters Programme, is essentially an R&D partnerships programme. So it's, if I could describe it like that, it's an element within the more all-embracing approach that Baz has recommended to government. So. Whilst we were very happy for the uh, shout-out from the Minister, from both Secretaries of State, in fact, um, we have to bear in mind that we are not trying to answer all the issues that Baz has raised. Um, so we are we are absolutely all used to the idea that uh, the creative industries uh, is a dynamic sector, a growing sector, um, Fastest growing sector for exports, fastest growing sector for employment. And the Creative Industries Council has done, uh, you know, produced lots of snazzy graphics that we're all getting increasingly used to, to using to make that point. But when the industrial strategy went, uh, went through its kind of early consultation exercise, the thing that came out as the most important mechanism that the creative industries felt uh, was appropriate for uh, supercharging that growth uh, was clusters. And obviously, you'll have seen a lot of the uh, work that's been done uh, that's advanced that argument over the last 18 months. So this is the Geography of Creativity in the UK, which is a report uh, done by uh, uh, Nesta with uh, Creative England. 
Um, and Nesta have been, uh, obviously Hassan and Juan at Nesta have been key in driving this forward. Um, but it's not just the creative industry, so other adjacent industries, Herb talks uh, about the digital sector, um, there's a lot of interest in mapping clustering within the digital sector and obviously within the definition of the creative industries, there's a very strong overlap between the two. And you end up with maps like these. Uh, so this is the last Nesta map. I, I a while ago looked back to see. So Nesta's first map had nine clusters on it. And it was, it was very hard to go around the country and give talks uh, like this about that because you were always in a place that wasn't on the map. Um, but now with 43, uh, obviously there are a lot more clusters identified. Um, and as long as one stays out of Birmingham, it's a much less difficult conversation because, of course, one of the things that's rather difficult is Birmingham, as a large city with a big creative sector, doesn't appear uh, within the Nesta clusters. Um, and uh, we were in Birmingham last week, and people advanced lots and lots of different arguments as to why that is. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do uh, was we want people, as I was saying earlier on, to, at the core of their proposals is we're not going to tell you what your cluster is. That is not our business. It's for up to you to tell us what your cluster is, what its strengths are, what its assets are. Um, however, what we would like you to do is argue that not only uh, uh, from your own knowledge, but with reference to, to, to some of the data. So um, I'll start with definitions, and then I'll show you some data that we're going to release. Probably, it'll probably be next. I keep saying this. It'll probably be next week now, um, because we have to keep doing these events. But So we're going to take... The, we're happy with the Nesta definition of, uh, of creative clusters. I think Baz has used it as well. It, it serves nobody any particularly well to kind of think of yet another definition. Um, so three core things. Geographic concentration of creative businesses and workers. Okay, so it is about workforce and it's about business. What I would like to suggest coming forward from this top line is that the definition of the cluster is defined by the industry not be designed by the research components. We can perhaps pick that up later. But the important thing is these businesses and this workforce, they're not just co-sited, but they're interlinked. They're, they, they operate within value chains. They collaborate. They compete with each other. One of the things that drives forward cl clusters is that people can develop their careers within clusters by moving between businesses and between uh, businesses and uh, intermediary organisations. That brings me on to the second point. So there are other organisations within the cluster than just businesses. Obviously, the key one for the point of this discussion is higher education institutions. But within clusters, particularly those that are based in, uh, in, in, in metro regions, cultural institutions play a huge part too. And they play a huge part in networking uh, the, uh, the cluster. But also, they themselves can act in a similar way to universities as, as, as kind of centres of gravity for businesses. So if you have large performing companies, uh, if you have something like live theatre, which is a right, you know, an, an original writing company, there's lots of things that actually cluster around those institutions as well as uh, around the university or, or, or with the um, business sector. But there are also other intermediary organisations, um, you know, playing the role, similar to, say, Codeworks did 10, 10 years ago in, in this region. Um, You've got intermediate organisations that are either cluster-specific or national, and you've got... Um, Nestle used the word government bodies, but uh, really it's about local economic development partners. So the LEPs, uh, we think, are absolutely key in this in England, the economic development companies in Scotland and the economic development agencies in Northern Ireland and Wales. So aligning what you're all trying to do with the strategy of those partners, be they city councils, metro regions, LEPs, is really, really crucial. Because what we're trying to do here is to reinforce success. Um, and so certainly in, in, at this stage in the programme, one important thing is identifying where all the conditions for success exist. So as well as telling us about your cluster in terms of its businesses, we want you to, and your, own, your research capability that drives into those businesses, we're also looking for you to tell us about the rest of the cluster, the intermediary bodies, and how you can align with their policies. And then there are, there's the point about different clusters. Are, uh, you know, clusters are different. Different sizes, different shapes, different architectures. Again, that's why we won't be saying delivering a whole load of top-down messages, because it isn't right. 
these things, if they're going to succeed, have to succeed from the conditions on the ground. So the architecture of your clusters, the things that they're good at, um, those crucial other elements, you know, the hubs, the shared workspaces, those kind of things that bind the clusters together are different in different places. You know, so, so again, it was down in Bristol last, last week, Bristol's rather unique, the watershed plays in that, in that Bristol cluster, plays a particularly unique role. Is it social space? Is it a, it's got labs, it's got all sorts of things, but it's just very Bristol. If you suggested building something like that somewhere else, it wouldn't work. So every cluster has different architectures like that. Some parts of it played by the HEI architecture, some by incubators, some by hubs, um, and, and, and in some smaller clusters just by pubs. So what we've done is, um, as I say, with reference to the data, um, when you look at the uh, overall UK creative industries data of the type produced by Nesta, what you tend to get is the heat map that you'd, you, you'd suggest, which is, you know, this is very, it's the creative industries, it's very heavily southeast focused, very metro region focused. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do was um, see, provide you with some data that's a little bit more granular than that, so you can have a look at it. And also, what we wanted to do was do this as a baseline for other elements in the program. So. Um, We'll release some data. Um, I'm just, I seem to have, okay. I might do these slides in a slightly different order. There we go. So this, so, um, this is the overall data that comes from uh, the, the, the last Nesta report and which will be revised in their next report, uh, Creative Nation. So this is the overall map of the creative industries in travel to work areas. So this is Nesta's definition of, of, of the unit of geography. Granular, but to be honest, not that granular yet. Um, and you see this heavy southeast focus. You see the, the central belt in London. You see the north. You see the northeast. So red is hot, blue is cold. Um, now, some sec what we've asked them to do is slice this by subsector. And we'll provide this as both raw data and as maps for you to use. So some sectors, um, and we've got the number of businesses on the left, the, number of uh, the level of employment on the right, and the shout-outs are the 10, um, 10 top travel-to-work areas uh, for, uh, under each condition. Um, some sectors, film and TV, rather reflect the overall focus. So you pull out Manchester, you pull out Glasgow, uh, you've, got, you've, you've got the South East. And obviously, for any of us who've been involved in the film and TV sector over the last 15 years, um, the... Uh, we have not been well served, I think it's fair to say, by a economic uh, geography policy making, um, particularly, I would say, east of the Pennines and north of Watford. Um, so the, the, the pattern has changed there substantially uh, over the years. But film and TV largely looks like the overall data. Um, if you look at architecture, it's quite different. So architecture, uh, uh, sometimes I feel a bit of a, a neglected area within the DCMS's definitions of creative industries. But the clustering within architecture isn't so concentrated. You've got, um, it's, it's, although they will be small in number, you've got peripheral areas with, with, uh, with, with high numbers of architects, which reflects a slightly distributed um, basis of the business that you can now work on. And then when you go to crafts, uh, you start to see a very different pattern, perhaps another Cinderella sector, but a very important one, and particularly for those who are interested in the uh, economic geography of the creative industries in rural areas. So you start to see, in employment terms, areas on the periphery becoming uh, disproportionately uh, important. Um, interestingly, when you go to museums and galleries, another one of those nine subsectors, um, in employment terms, uh, the southeast bias almost disappears completely, which is perhaps one of the most surprising things that are coming out of this data, considering you think of the number of national institutions based in London. Um, but the sector is much more widely spread. Uh, and, and certainly of interest to this area. So what we're... Oh, I'm going to go now go back, because I've put the, the new, some specific slides in in the wrong place. So, hello. There we go. So again, what, what we're going to do is release this data so that you can use it. I mean, it's twofold. Use it if it's useful. It just gives some more granular data for you to use. Uh, and what we're looking at now is some is some data pulled out on the right hand side across the across the north of England. Um, let me see where did we get to music and performing arts, advertising and marketing. That's the first one, yeah. So um, 
it's also so that we've got a somewhat of a baseline when people approach us with bids saying we have a fantastic cluster in sector X which is world class because we've all read lots of multidisciplinary grant applications that say da di da di da world class sector or world class production company we just want some kind of baseline to measure that against because I don't think that the, 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 uh, this is going to be a complicated uh, assessment and I think we need to uh, have some reference points as well. So if you say you've got a world-class se uh, sector or a world-class cluster in this, it's not to say that people won't believe you. It's just that it appears as dark blue on these maps. They might be a little more sceptical. So um, it's just reference. So these are, these are some of those broken down by travel to work area across, uh, across the north of England. And you can see, again, architecture is quite interesting, the way that splits out, as is software and computer services something that picks, picks out both this region and obviously and Yorkshire, uh, museums, galleries, and libraries, um, ignoring the fact that Leicester seems to be for these purposes um, somewhere in the North Riding. Um, you'll see, um, yeah, our mapping abilities need some improvement before we release this data. Um, publishing, which is, which is quite distributed across the UK, but with a focus in Manchester, and so on. So what we're going to do, they'll all be on the CE programme website. I don't know exactly when, but we will try and make it by the end of this week. And it will be raw data and some maps. And, and please use it as you will, because it throws up some interesting, um, uh, some interesting points uh, to argue about regional focus and regional strengths. Um, sorry, I'll just step through these. And... So Baz said... Um, there were three reasons for supporting creative clusters. So um, providing a stimulus to regional growth being the main one. It's worth saying that within this whole framework of the industrial strategy, there is a considerable emphasis on placemaking and place-based economics. So one of the things about this money from the point of view of the research councils is this is not normal research council funding, it's industrial strategy funding. So there is an emphasis from Bayes, and particularly with our current Secretary of State, who believes this very strongly, of, of placemaking and rebalancing the economy uh, regionally. So the ability of uh, the partnerships that you put forward to drive regional economic growth will be an, uh, an important factor. Um, but as I also said that one of the keys for, for, for um, supporting clusters was increasing productivity. So that's about increasing the density of businesses within the cluster or, or, or scaling up the businesses within the cluster. So um, productivity increases within creative clusters with the density and size of the businesses within the cluster, which seems obvious, but is obviously a, a preoccupation uh, and, and, and a rationale for, for projects like, uh, uh, like, like the Fuse. But perhaps the third one of the things that Baz talked about is the one that's absolutely core here to, to, to this program, which is developing tailored talent and R&D pipelines for local areas by forging that close links between education and industry. And I think particularly, obviously, the focus for us is the R&D um, pipeline. But the way that feeds back into a talent pipeline and the way the two interact with each other is also a really key area of importance, I would <laughs> think, for the education institutions, but also uh, for industry. So, what's the programme itself? Um, now, I apologise for the repetition in this. Uh, as I say, some of it's because we're not very good at presentations, and some of it's because um, we uh, want to repeat things so that they're actually heard. So, the programme is about growing the creative industries through driving R&D in new products, services, and experiences, and I'm sure we'll have questions on that. Um, as I say... This is not normal AHRC business. It's not normal AHRC business, not just because of its emphasis on industry, not just because it's the industrial strategy, but because it's the AHRC leading a program on behalf of UKRI. I think we're leading it because we care more about the creative industries than perhaps the other research councils, but that doesn't mean this is all about the arts and humanities. So it's about creating a robust creative R&D infrastructure, and how much money have we got? We've got, so you'll see 80 million, you'll see 39 million, so we've got 51 million pounds in cash, just to complicate uh, matters. And that's to enhance the uh, connection between creative industries and HEI. So this is the, the new funding that we've got at the moment. And what we're planning is up to eight R&D partnerships. I'm not sure if that was the same in the document, the, the first call-out document, that might have said eight. And it might have 
now say up to eight. Um, it may change again. It'll be, always be eight, but um, that's, that's our feeling. We want these things to be a sufficient size. Um, and also to create a, a, a policy and evidence centre, so an independent observatory on data on the creative industries, which has been called for, I think, between industry, between re researchers and increasingly now a recognition in government that we need that. I'm not going to talk about what we call the PEC because that's subject to a separate, uh, separate process, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure those who are interested will be aware of. Um, so what's the scope of these things? What are they there to do? So we've identified a number of opportunities and threats for the creative industry. So again, think industry. These are challenges for industry. So new, new business models and IP regulation. Personally, I think new business models are more important than IP regulation over the piece, but for certain sectors that's not true. The challenges of investment, access to finance and growth. Challenges of skills, skills shortages, both short and long term. Of trading into international markets, of exports, that's a good thing. Some of our sectors have significant challenges around equality and diversity. And some of them also have challenges around collaboration and particularly accessing markets and the need for collaboration in that around supply chains. But having said all that, we are encouraging people to look at all of those through the eyes or the, the kind of lead amongst the others of innovation in products and services. I always add experiences in there because I think that that brings, we should not forget the kind of performance uh, and attention uh, economy as part of this and experiences seems a good way to describe that. So product and service innovation, um, definite, definitely a key. I think it adds a set focus. I think it also allows us in the future to play a more active role in the conversation around R&D and the definition of R&D. Um, we are aiming to enhance create existing creative clusters. It's very important to leverage existing assets. A couple of reasons for that. Uh, the, the main one being we want this to work. So we want to find the conditions, the, the places that have most of the conditions for success, and that's in existing clusters. BAS has a whole set of recommendations about growing clusters and what's needed for that, growing new clusters, or establishing clusters at different stages of development, that's not our focus. We have to be quite frank about that. That doesn't mean we want them all to be the same. It doesn't mean that we aren't aware of different architectures. We see its core is bringing higher education institutions, the industries, and those cluster enablers into a partnership. And these R&D partnerships are primarily, they must be primarily designed by you, not by us, to address the challenges of the cluster businesses in the cluster. There are going to be research questions that everybody's going to find really exciting that aren't faced by businesses in their own cluster, which is excellent, but it's not the focus of what we're asking for here. Um, the impetus, the, the, the growth imperative um, is, is key, and we're looking for impact, measurable impact on the creative bit industries in your cluster. And the PEC has a slightly different focus on independent analysis and the creative industries. Again, subject to a different call. So, key features of these R&D partnerships, again, I'll say it again, just in case we didn't hear it the first time or the fifth time, <laughs> embedded within existing creative clusters. So these are partnerships within a cluster. Um, you must be able to identify the barriers, and we would like you to take a challenge-led approach. So these are the challenges of this cluster. And these are the challenges that we can attack with R&D. And the important thing about attacking it with R&D is you're not just to bring the assets of the universities to bear on this. So though each partnership is hosted, has a host HEI, it must bring together and explain to us how it brings together the relevant partners that are needed. So industry, local regional government, sector bodies, economic development, and the investment community. Now... Bringing together is not the same as necessarily having them as, you know, uh, this being a massive consortium, but we do want you to articulate how you can convene those people. Um, we want it to be about collaboration and a collaborative design and delivery. We want it to be an innovative R&D programme, as you'd expect, but I think what we mean by that is this is new activity. The focus must be on new activity. I'll say something a little more about that at the end, because the focus on new activity may not just be <laughs> new things, but it may be different things. We imagine these things as, multi, as, as, as multidisciplinary. 
Some of us are keen on anti-disciplinary as a way of describing this, in the sense that it, uh, we do expect the arts and humanities to have a huge role to play in this, but we also expect STEM and the social sciences. What we need you to do is bring together the disciplines that you need to answer the challenge and not prejudge that. And we'd expect them to be dynamic. So we'd like a really clear focus on the challenges and the approaches at the outset. But we know over time that that'll change. That might change because of where the, where the research takes you. It might change because of other things that are going on in the cluster. Um, we know it will change over time. Um, so a little bit about identifying challenges. So a challenge, again, must be defined by the needs of the cluster. So if, there's a, if, you're, if you're focusing your cluster on a particular um, set of businesses, or, 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 or uh, then they must be challenges that those businesses would recognise. They must not just be challenges that the research community would recognise, because as somebody who's, who's worked in R&D partnerships with industry, you'd be surprised how, how different those can be. Um, so we wanted to have a due focus on R&D for new product services and experience, experiences, and again, once you've identified these challenges, they should be addressable by the people in the partnership. That tells you who the partners are, is who do you need to bring together to solve the challenge. Um, and they should be distinct and measurable. And the focus here on measurability is around, is around growth. We are not in a straitjacket of ERDF type jobs created, jobs uh, uh, protected. But we do want to have a discussion as the process goes on, about how the KPI and measurement framework should evolve. Uh, and we're very interested in better measures than those rather crude ones. Um, and that's a conversation, and we expect that the kind of KPIs and measurement framework, Dylan can talk about this much better, um, will emerge around phase two when we've got a, a kind of shortlist of bids. Um, what do you need? Key points. Uh, you need strategy and vision. So you need strategy, basically. Uh, but the, each of these partnerships sort of have a vision of what they're trying to do, but that's derived from the strengths and characteristics of the cluster, the people who are in the partnership, who's involved, what do they contribute? Um, they're not just along for the crest, um, and, and possibly they're not just along for the match funding. Who knows? Um, but it's all got to relate back to that central, what are the challenges the partnership's trying to solve? Um, core element of the bid, uh, you don't have to worry about this at the expression of interest stage, is collaborative R&D, so the programmes that you'll do to meet the challenge, how you do that through uh, collaboration um, across sector and across disciplines. So uh, I think as from observing from outside, there's been lots of incentives for lots of universities to collaborate in very wide-ranging, geographically dispersed partnerships. This is not that, I think. Um, so collaboration, the hardest collaborations of some of the institutions I know are between departments in the same building. But that would be quite interesting. And it might just work, because clusters are all about bumping into people in corridors. Um, you need strong leadership. So it's a shared vision and a shared leadership. That's going to be absolutely key, as is a, a governance structure that allows you to make sure the partners do what they said they would do at the start. Because I have a fear, which I've shared with colleagues, that though Bayes doesn't have a very strict framework for this yet, it will have one at some point in the future, and we'll get a kicking. In turn, we'd like to give a kicking to the people who lead the partnerships, and it would be good for them to think about how they give a kicking to their partners. Um, that sounds, to most people in academia, unpleasant, but for in business, that sounds just like common sense. Um, I think it's interesting to think about what the appropriate leader, director, you tend to think about PIs, and this would be whether that's uh, a, an incredibly brilliant, referable research academic or whether it's someone with an industry background. I think, that's, uh, I, I think both routes uh, would be very acceptable to us. And the final thing I say on this is the application it is not on behalf of the lead academic institution. It is an application by them on behalf of the whole partnership. Now, I know, again, that may seem obvious. But I think it's just worth bearing in mind that you're applying on behalf of the partnership if you're going to leave one of these bids. Key dates, I mean, you probably know this, so we're, we're doing these briefing events now. Uh, we've asked for a, for, for a statement of intent. Um, don't overthink the statement of intent. We try to reduce it down to being a very simple document. Um, its purpose for us is twofold. 
One is to get a sense of the number of bids and the, the focus of them, so we can start to think about recruiting uh, the appropriate panel and peer review into this. Um, so that's that's an AHRC concern. Um, we're not going to, you're not going to be held to what's in your statements of intent. The other reason is to have a community that we can then communicate with without fearing that we'll miss anybody out. So it will be interesting for both uh, the team at AHRC uh, and, and for my creative economy team to be able to talk to you about these things uh, and communicate out. Uh, stage one applications early December. So the real focus probably of everybody should be on the stage one application, not so much on the statement of intent, although don't forget to send it because you can't make a stage one bid without a statement of intent. Um, we're going to turn around those stage ones uh, as quickly as we can. So early February at the latest. And the idea is then to develop to a short list and then have further discussions leading to a stage two application. Uh, no by early summer. And because the industrial strategy has a time to die meter on it of now three years, or three and a half, it was three and a half years, but it keeps, uh, it keeps in the same place. We've got to get moving by this time next year, open for business. So I just want to leave a final thought on this before I bring up, uh, we do some questions. Um, so when we first, when I first came in, we started talking about what we were going to do about creative economy research. We thought about three things. So research about the creative economy. So that's something that we want more of and we want higher quality of. And there's great stuff and we all recognise it. And probably that's the job of the PEC. Uh, best, better, encouraging better and more research about the creative economy, particularly in GAPS. Um, we thought about research with the creative economy. This is what the KE hubs did brilliantly, was explored lots of ways for researchers and companies to work together. Subject, of course, to delivering referable outcomes, which was a guiding principle, uh, if not of the design, certainly of the teams who ran them. Uh, and then we talked about research for the creative economy. So this is interesting. So this is, I think, the, the really exciting area is what is the research that takes place in universities between different departments in new ways that drives practice uh, within the creative and cultural industries, moves practice forward and moves businesses forward. So I think it's probably fair to say that in terms of the weight, um, this programme is not about, is not as a, uh, not fundamentally for funding research about the creative economy. It probably is interested in research with, but those probably are methods rather than objectives in themselves. And what this is really about is a new kind of research for the creative economy. And that's why the emphasis on business, the emphasis on industry, and when I say industry, I mean cultural industries as well as creative industries. Um, and it's identifying their challenges and using research to solve them and point new ways forward. So uh, that's it. Uh, that's, 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 um, that's our brief for you. Uh, and Dylan, do you want to come up? And I think you've got a mic. And, and now what, um, what we'll do is take some questions on that. Is that working? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so who wants, to, who wants to start us off? Graham. Um, Andrew, you said at the beginning that you worked at uh, Graham Thompson University, Sunderland. Uh, you said at the beginning that you were with Andrew talking to the Googles and the ITVs and, and the big sort of uh, national players in the, in the creative industries. And, and if, I, if I read your steer rightly, you were saying maybe it's not for us as individual institutions or individual partnerships to be looking at those um, organisations. How, how do you see, so you know, you will get hopefully lots of uh, applications uh, at the end of October with you know great ideas. At that stage, do you see your role as being a bit of a matchmaker? So you can say, well, that project over there might do well to work more closely with Google. Or I mean, how, how, how do you see that matchmaking service that you were outlining? So I think um, I think we're slightly prisoners of the timetable to be honest. So, so I think, as Herb said earlier on, I think there's, there's real challenges in, in engaging some of, those, some of those big players. So we've got lots of conversations underway. And I think there's kind of two stages to it in terms of matchmaking. So we're very keen that um, if people are at the stage that their expressions uh, of interest 
to be able to identify the challenges that the sector faces, the things they want to focus on, um, or to, um, to identify where they want to attract other people into. The, the, the form, and there's a tick box at the bottom that allows you to share, uh, to share that data. Um, we're very keen that people do that to the extent that they can. Um, will we have all those national partners in place by um, November so those conversations can feed forward into stage one bids? I'd love to think so, but I fear that we won't have all of them in place. So I think there's two stages to it. So one is we'll do what we can at that stage, and certainly if people want introductions making or matchmaking that we can help with, um, we're very happy to do that up until the stage one bids are in. Um, and I think that we'll carry on those conversations with some of those national partners so that as we get to a short list, we can perhaps introduce them in a more strategic way into, you know, and, and have discussions and fora where they can look at their priorities and look at what are people's emerging plans and do that in a perhaps a, a, you know, a kind of a, a deeper way at that stage. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say that um, we don't want people, but lots of people have existing relationships with those big big players, and there is no way that we don't want you to use them. Absolutely not. It's just that there may be project, there may be ideas and partnerships that haven't got those networks, which would be of, you know, a great interest to those larger players, which we can, you know, match make subsequently. Is that, does that kind of answer it? I think um, Herb's point as well around having some kind of network in between the funded R and D partnerships as well, and especially yes. working with bigger partners like that. So adds value right across the program. That's yeah, really yeah, and that's definitely that's definitely an aspiration. I mean, we're this is the thing about as as you'll realise from having picked up the the head uh, the heads up um, call from before the summer. This is still kind of slightly work in progress, um, and and we, so we've got some things that we that we're still working on in the background. Uh, yep, yeah, at the back, please. Hi, um, I'm Professor Richard Clay, Newcastle University, um, part of the Creative Fuse Northeast. Um, I'm interested in how you feel about the idea of the ecosystem within which there are clusters of businesses operating. So we heard her uh, mention this morning that we have very strong VR, AR, MR organisations, for example, in Newcastle Gates. But I was talking to the CEO of one of those companies the other week and he was saying that one of his major challenges is keeping the staff here that he's recruited. And so he lets them go out and work with artists, for example, or he lets them go out and work with old people. And there's no necessary immediate economic benefit, although sometimes there can be for the business down the line, but it's more about holding on to talent. So while I'm thinking about putting one of these bits together, or helping put one of these bits together, I'm thinking that while we can have foci which are on particular known clusters within the northeast, it's really important to understand that they're part of a much broader creative economy. So are you receptive to that kind of thinking? Um, I think the problem answer to that is yes and no. So we're definitely receptive to that kind of thinking because that shows that a fundamental understanding of the of not only how clusters work, but how this cluster works, say, if it's Newcastle Gateshead, and how the business, what the challenges of the businesses are within it. Um, I think then the question, the, 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 the reason I potentially raise no is that still doesn't affect that our focus is on how you solve some of those challenges. Um, that's what the program's there to fund. So this is the distinction I build between the overall challenges the cluster faces and what we're trying to do here. And that is, there's, the, 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 there's, it's a seesaw that, because obviously you can't solve, you can't say, we're just gonna do R&D, uh, and it's gonna have a real impact if that ignores the articulation of the rest of the cluster, and something about those, you, you end up with great research projects that have no traction, or they don't work for the businesses. So I think this is the bit that really, um, I would say is for you to solve, is to argue the case about what the important bits are there. So I think it's a problem for lots of clusters that I know um, about, uh, about retention. Particularly, it's, it's a thing that, particularly from a university point of view, you, you develop all these fantastic graduates and postgraduates, and, and retaining them within the region is difficult. That's a feature of the UK creative industries. 
as all the trains go somewhere else. Um, so I think that um, we understand that and, and please articulate that, but please articulate why what you're going to do is gonna bear on that problem rather than that, that what we need to do is just focus on that problem. Does that kind of answer it? It's gonna be one of several things that we're gonna say, that's what you have to decide, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think, okay, nice this, liked it. <laughs> Sorry, Damien. Hi, Damien Murphy, the University of York. So you mentioned a few times that the, the call is still being shaped a little bit. And so I guess uh, I'm just thinking, what might we anticipate that will happen between now and sort of the end of the Well, I, I, so I don't think, I don't, we're not going to change the call spec between now and December the 7th. Um, I think we have got this ambition to set, uh, you know, that we've got this discussion with these larger partners. Um, some of that may emerge in that timeline. It won't affect what the proposals are. It just might, um, you know, inject some opportunities in it. But I think that that's probably going to be more second stage. We are taking the questions that we're getting at these events back. And so uh, some of the things, uh, some of the specific questions we've been asked, and particularly in the, in the briefing sessions, um, are things that we've, we're going away and finding an answer, which um, Dylan and the team are pro producing a Q&A as we go along. So there's things there, definitional points. But I think the other thing is, um, the, the, the emerging bit is, when we get to a shortlist and there's a smaller number of, 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 of propositions to deal with, I think then at that point there's, there's a degree of conversation going to go on, both with external partners, strategic partners, you know, maybe the, if, if people want... Uh, I can imagine, this is just an example, this is not a steer. I can imagine a cluster that focuses, uh, say, on heritage and museums, but, doesn't, but then it might be worth exploring whether some of the national museums who aren't in the cluster could contribute to that. But if we don't have one of those, then, then what's, what, kind of what's the point? It's that kind of thing. So we're not going to move the goalposts between now and, uh, and, and December. No. Unless we are. No, we're not. <coughs> no, we're not. I mean, no, I would not. imagine no, that the, the, the call scope, the shape of it will stay the same. The guidance, if there's anything massively glaring, which we've completely overlooked, in, in best intentions of getting it right, we may iterate that slightly. Again, you get the FAQ document, but also when the first stage bids come in, you'll get specific tailored feedback for your particular bid. So that might ask you to pick on specific aspects of the proposal that you've put together or focus on some things or where there's certain aspects of your bids that are not actually in line with what we were intending to do. So, yeah, I think we're sort of seeing it as a, we use the term dynamic process. I think it's dynamic for us as much as it is for you in terms of giving you the freedom to kind of iterate your project as it, as it kind of goes along a little bit. <coughs> yeah, the back, please. And then the other side at the back. Uh, Heather Levin, Science City, York. Just a question to get a bit of clarification, really. Um, you're talking about almost effectively open innovation with big and small players in the creative industries. You're also talking about linking up with social sciences and STEM subjects as well as creative industries and within the subsectors of the creative industries. But you're also saying we can't cock this up. Um, you know, so how brave are we talking here? Because most innovations of that nature, we won't cock 90% of it up. Um, you know, are we looking at being disruptive and brave, or are we trying to pick specific projects which may be quite safe? Well, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Because, um, you know, you've picked up on the central dilemma of all these things, which is we want you, everybody wants you to be risky and brave and guarantee success at the same time, uh, which, is, which is hard. Um, so I think, what we've, I, I think what we're trying to set out is, that is, is, is fairly clearly um, what is our approach to risk. So one of the reasons to embed this program within existing clusters is that we think that those strong clusters, those, those clusters with strong existing relationships uh, stand a better chance of, of, of both identifying R&D addressable challenges and delivering on them than others. Because if the, if the network's good, if the mutual understanding is there, and if the assets are there, then that seems... So that's our, that's our risk mitigation bit, I think. Um, I think that the emphasis on... Uh, product services and experiences innovation is the bit where we are hoping that you will push the boat out a bit. 
because um, that level of R and D and thinking about it as as creative research, perhaps is you know is, a, is another term that it's going to be early stage and and some of it should be quite radical because we're looking at we're hoping you'll identify challenges that need really you know really creative research programs to address them. So I think there we'd like you to be quite brave. So I suppose what we're trying to do is mitigate mitigate that you know the, the riskiest thing of all would be um, a loosely networked emergent cluster with a really radical idea is quite that's kind of got kind of quite a high level of of un, uh, 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 of unaddressable risk because are the conversations and the relationships really strong enough to deliver or are you going to spend the first three years talking about those things so i think i think that's the kind of balance um i think possibly from a from a from a university point of view we're looking at types of research that aren't so familiar so i think i'm really interested in how you, how you do this how do you make a, a kind of research program that's responsive to industry and truly includes them you know so for my background which is both science and and and, and kind of creative r d um and and uh creative production is i think you know I can only think of this in terms of, you know, kind of labs or studios where you bring people together, <coughs> but you bring them together to do stuff, to make stuff. But that may not be the way other people approach it. You're nodding slowly as if that was kind of, again, the answer you kind of feared. <laughs> um, I think we had one at the... I learned about this at Dublin University. Um, you mentioned about the intention to submit going in to get the reviewers and panels and things organised. And um, one of the problems that we see whenever, and this is right across all the funders, not just research councils, whenever we have a new program that's really exciting like this, and we're asked for really ambitious programs, and it's not business as usual, we then face a real difficulty in the assessment of yeah. those, yeah. because they are assessed in exactly the same way that our other projects are assessed. Yeah. So it would be really great to hear what you guys might be doing to try and address that, okay. so that we are pushing the boat out, but then it's actually received in a kind of constructive yeah. way. So we put quite a lot of attention into the design of our sort of decision-making process and assessment process on this. So the one thing we're not doing is using the standard AHRC moderation, peer review moderation panel model, um, strictly because we don't feel like that really is going to fit a programme like this, which is obviously a multidisciplinary, multi-partner industry perspective. So what we're going to do is construct a specific panel which is going to have expertise that spans right across the kind of aspirational aims of the programme. So what, there probably will be a few people from the HRC Peer Review College, um, particularly people that have got that kind of wider strategic overview of how to work with these kind of big industry programmes or big initiatives. Um, we'll also be finding people from other, other sort of research backgrounds like some of the STEM and social sciences stuff as appropriate. But we're also going to make sure that we've got people from industry on the panel as well. Um, and also from some of those other kind of sector bodies, trade bodies, those kind of organisations that, that make up part of that actual cluster, you know, the clustering process. Um, and the, the way that we're going to actually manage it, we're going to do it as an assessment panel. So I would say the assessment panel process, rather than sending a proposal out to a, a peer reviewer in isolation, where they're looking at it from the perspective of how they see their, maybe their discipline fitting into it, the process won't quite be like that. It'll be more of a kind of collaborative assessment process. So you're going to have a conversation between people who can then discuss some of those thorny issues around things like interdisciplinarity. Because I think what I've seen when you ask for these strongly radical interdisciplinary programmes, the, the edges kind of tend to get knocked off by the peer review process. And whereas I think where individuals um, obviously can think quite radically about how um, interdisciplinary should, interdisciplinarity should work and partnerships and those kind of things should work, they tend to get rather safe when they're doing peer reviews and then that gets seen and, you know, without there being a kind of two-way discussion discussion. So I think that's why we're designing the peer review process to be in this kind of assessment panel collaborative peer review model. So it's quite a different way for us to do things um, and it, it, is, it will be <coughs> potentially quite tricky for us because it's going to take us a bit of time to design that process properly. Um, and the other thing we're going to do is we're going to do specific training for that actual panel to ask them to pick up on the things that are requested from the programme and to be aware of the kinds of issues that we're identifying but also you're identifying to us as difficulties. So it is something we've put quite a considerable amount of effort and time and thought into um, how we're going to actually handle it. Because I think it, it will make or break this process ultimately. Yeah, and I, th I think it's, uh, I think you're absolutely, Dylan's absolutely right, and I'm sure you've had the same, which is that, that um, multidisciplinary projects get killed in peer review. 
I think it's also worth saying that this reflects how we're trying, the, how we've already developed the programme. So, so the links between this, this programme and the Creative Industries Council and the key kind of leaders in the Creative Industries Council is very, very strong. They're very strong advocates of the programme, but it does mean that we will be able to pull in people who, from industry, who also get that strategic objective. So it's not just, oh, X is from the game sector and will therefore do brilliant assessments about the game sector. I think, I think we've, we've, you know, we've got quite deep structural links. That's one of the good things we have been able to put in place um, in the short time. Uh, yeah, please. Oh, sorry, Vanessa, I didn't recognize. else. You've got your glasses on. <laughs> I'm interested in the match funding aspect because one of the biggest contributors in the Great Economies in the UK is the Arts Council. And they're not mentioned at all in any aspect of this. So I'm just in interested to know if you've been down with the Arts Council and if you have Arts Council funding partners, can that be included as match? Because they're not excluded on that list. Yeah. No, no, they're not excluded. What we're saying with the match funding is if you're funding from existing sources of funding, that, that only stuff that's specifically for the aims of this programme can be counted as match. Mm -hmm. So if you've got ongoing Arts Council funding for something that is in line with, the, with the, what the drive of your, your R&D partnership will be, and it, it's running before that, then you can't count that towards your match funding. Whereas if you start the programme up and then you manage to identify and secure some funding from an additional source, then you can bring that in as part of the match funding. So it's really just to avoid that kind of process of double counting funding from various sources um, and then just piling it all into a big match funding soup and um, you know, and then just saying that's our match funding for the programme. It has to be specifically targeted to the aims of this R&D partnership and the Creative Industry Clusters programme. I, I think, just to pick up on the level of conversations with, with, with Arts Council, I think there's two levels of conversation. So a lot of you will have relationships both with Arts Council RFOs and with Arts Council on a regional basis. Those are very important, I think, to putting together these bids. We have a national conversation with Arts Council as well, and that's part of this larger partnership programme we're trying to put together. So I think there's the kind of two levels at which it operates. There's things that you'll come to us with. What we're trying to do is try and find a match of that at a national conversation that we can add to the programme, as it were. Yep. Hi there, uh, Mark Oates from the University of Solon and uh, part of the Creative Fuse Northeast project. Can you just say a little bit more about um, the kind of the time scales that you're working to here? Because the funding call speaks to 54 months and there's the time scale associated with the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. Yeah. From HRC's perspective, are bidders expected to know the end point of the journey or the destination by you know, 54 months from 2018? Or is it more about saying we're on this journey and we'll be continuing? What absolutes do we need to present if we're bidding? Um, well, yes. the absolute will be the amount that the top level of the amount of bid that we're expecting to see. So I think what, what we've got, so because of the CSR periods with the industrial strategy, what's confirmed by them so far is 39 million, but then there is a commitment to an additional um, <coughs> 15 or 16 million, like the 16 million beyond the end of that period. But then obviously, because it's outside the CSR period, they can't commit to that. So what we're doing as an organisation, we're, we're going to make a commitment that we'll obviously make sure that that, that, that fund money is going to be there. Okay, so um, I probably didn't make myself particularly clear. It's just about the funding, it's more about the ambitions that you're setting. Right, okay. So the end point by which we will deliver these outcomes for the cluster, yeah. or uh, X, Y, Z, or this is the journey we've started. I, I, I'll use the example of placemaking because it would be brilliant if we could create environments within 54 months Okay, so I think uh, I I think you're looking at differentiating the outcomes that are delivered by different strands of what you're proposing. So if some of those you know deliver within the program period, so if you're doing you know R and D for a particular subsector of businesses that are focusing around a subsector of challenges, I think we'd like to know what the uh, what the deliverables of that are within the time scale and where within those, you know, so they t obviously take time to accrue. Um, some of them will be around activities, some of them will be around, you know, impacts and pick up from businesses. Um, I think some of those other activities, as you say, are about making more sustainable long-term impacts on the cluster. And I think at this stage, the, the, certainly in the stage one bids, 
um, if you can identify, differentiate between those two and argue why, the, wh why you believe those timescales are right and, and why it's important that some of them are, you know, within the program period and some of them will continue to accrue afterwards, then I think yeah. that's good enough for us. I mean, obviously, we'll, we'll, we, the life of the programme in terms of what we're given funding for would be that 54 months, so we'll, ha we'll have expectations to report against that. But I think, yeah, the sustainability stuff, if, if it goes on, but you can still tell us about what's happened with it, and ultimately that's going to be an excellent impact of the programme in general if it's still managing to deliver or still putting something in place to enable those kind of, um, sort of places and infrastructure to actually sort of thrive afterwards. Really and I, yeah, and I think one of the hardest things in this whole sector is, is achieving sustainable long-term relationships between industry and the HEI sector. You know, if, if you're in an industry, the problem is people are either on grant or off grant. When they're off grant, they're teaching, they don't take your phone calls. A project doesn't go anywhere. Um, and, and, and equally, the problem on the other side. So I think we're aware of those problems. If there are things that you can identify and say that will change those, over whatever time scale, then just you know include that as part of the bid. Have we got a last question. Anyone? Yes, down the front. Thanks. Um, so I, it's Annie Jameson, uh, National Science and Media Museum. Um, I'm just Um, so you've talked a lot about academic partners, you've talked a lot yep. about industry partners, you've briefly mentioned Greenpeace and Heritage once or twice. Um, I just wonder if you can say anything about what kinds of roles you might anticipate museums and heritage organisations playing in these partnerships. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think there's a number of different levels that particularly you know museums and heritage partners can play. So. Um, they are an important part of the creative industries. Um, I think one of the interesting things about museums uh, and the wider heritage sector is they're not only important for themselves, but from the cluster of industry that they support around them, cluster of economic activity they support around them. I think they are vital test beds for some new experiences. Uh, and I think that, you know, most a lot of creative businesses, a lot, who knows why after they've done a couple of projects, but like working with them. It's, you know, because you get an audience and you articulate a certain focus. So there's, there's, there's a number of levels. I mean, so just to take this, you know, the, the, this locality, Tarn and Weir museums are fantastically strong in engaging audiences. Um, on the other hand, you have organisations like Science Museum Group who are an IRO. So they can be a funded partner in these programmes. Um, they can't lead a, a, a partnership bid. But obviously, with the preoccupations of certain parts of the of the group uh, and certain collections and the way they're embedded within clusters, they offer both a test bed and an important partner and a huge set of resources in some ways, you know whether it be curatorial resource, whether it be visitor resource. So I think they they play a kind of potentially really exciting role. I think you know people have talked about Im Im immersive and uh, VR, AR, uh, MR, XR. I heard the other day, so everybody's sitting at XR. Um, I personally think that museums are a fabulous way of uh, an exciting area for, 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 for piloting that with live, with, with live audiences. And I think that's, you know, we'll see some advances in those sectors that use museums in the heritage sector. It's personal interest, but, you know, so I think there's lots of ways that, um, that either within the cluster bids or as research organisations in their own right um, the, 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 I think particularly the museum and gallery sector. The wider heritage sector, I think, is, is, is bringing in, you know, National Trust, English Heritage and things, I think has its own challenges. But I, I personally would love to see some of those organisations in these partnerships. Thank you. Okay, right. So there's... Dylan and the team will be taking, you'll all have lots more technical questions, probably um, lots of them about match funding um, for this afternoon. Uh, and we're all looking forward to those. Um, but now I just want to kind of wrap up the morning by bringing my panel onto the, onto the stage to see if any of this um, makes sense to them. So um, Professor Vanessa Tolman, who has stood up first. Uh, if, Vanessa, if you'd like to come and join us and take the end seat, I'm going to call everybody up. Uh, so 
uh, Vanessa is Director of City and Cultural Engagement at the University of Sheffield. Um, Professor Chris Carr. Chris, where are you? Great. Um, so uh, Chris is the Head of School of Design at the University of Leeds. Um, and as, uh, as I'm sure we'll find out, has a particular take on uh, what design means in, in this context. Um, Sean Allen, Sean, where? There you are, right, Sean. So Sean is actually a business, well, a part of a business. Um, Director of Immersive Technologies at Hedgehog Lab. So immersive is an area that has repeatedly come up in these conversations, in fact, in all of the briefings. I think we all think it's an exciting and transformative era for the creative industry, so it'll be interesting to hear what Sean thinks about what we should do with these partnerships. And Colin Bell, who is uh, the Business Growth Director for the Northeast LEP. So we see the LEPs as important partners for those who are bidding, uh, and, and perhaps we can um, pursue that. So at the risk of, what I'm going to try and do is get you guys to talk, because there's been far too much of me so far. So, um, Sean, let's start with you. Does any of this make sense? From you of a business point of view. Yeah, it makes sense. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's good to have uh, such an initiative happening. And uh, it's, yeah, it's good to get involved. So do, do you, from your experience of working with, you know, universities, researchers, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, right throughout your business, what would you, um, what would you encourage people to focus on if they're approaching, want, want businesses involved in their partnership? Oh, I've got to try and be a little bit politically correct. Um, no, nope, don't bother. <laughs> <coughs> don't assume you know more than the business, I would say. Um, I personally have been involved in XR. Let's get this out of the way as well, XR. Okay, so there's the various terms, as you pointed out, AR, VR, MR. The reason for XR was to try and get rid of the other three. Yep. But I've seen it on, on, on various printed matter, people using the whole four. Which is just crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been involved in um, early VR for about nine years, um, way before the headsets and all that stuff. Um, and I actually came from uh, working in a, in a university. Uh, I'd been at, working in Southern University for around about 11 years uh, and saw the possibilities for VR along with an academic um, and left to set up my previous company, Vector 76 as a 100% VR business. Um, yeah, I would just, it, it's that, it's kind of sometimes um, we've experienced over the years that when we try to engage with um, various academic institutions, they kind of think they know more than us, but in this occasion, in this popular sectors as well, they don't. Okay, so, that, so, so that's an interesting one, perhaps we'll come back to it, which is how you set the strategy yep. for these kind of partnerships. Um, Vanessa? Yeah, hello. So hello. you're one of the things that you do is is really make this, in a way, as I understand it, make sure the university work in the city. Mm -hmm. And um, so, <coughs> from your point of view, what's the opportunity here for a for a let's say a city cluster from 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 where you're situated? I think there's two opportunities really. All the universities are doing work in cities. They're doing it in different ways. Some universities will specialise in engineering, some in design, all different ones. And we can't do everything. That's, that's, we don't have the funding, we don't have the knowledge sometimes that we think we have. So we have to prioritise. <clears throat> so what we did in Sheffield is really looked at what the strengths of the creative industry was. And we're led by that narrative. And I think it's really important. It's very easy for academics to say, well, we're world leading. But if that industry is not there, then it's no point in kind of putting it in place for the sake of a grant. The most important thing for me for this is actually going for it for the right reasons, not going for it for overheads for your university or for grant awards on your CV, but going it because you want to change the placemaking cultural economy that you're around and have the opportunities for universities to get credit for the work they've already done for a long time. For me, if I'm forced into a, a thought the situation where you can get the funding if you do this and it doesn't actually impact on the city I'm in, then <coughs> I'm not interested. I have to be really honest. It has to have a defined effect on the city or city region I'm in. It really does. Because otherwise, the resources you put in can actually be 
piloted, targeted to one area of your city's economy and have a bigger impact. So to me, my advice to people is go with your strengths, go with the partners that you know about, go with your gut instinct as a lead or a co-I and take that initiative. And we've all known, all of us, we've asked the questions about peer review and assessments, we've all known you'll get through if you're joining with all these other ones around the country and suddenly you find yourself in an unhappy marriage and you don't want to be there. So even if it means, to me, you've got to be true to the creative economy that your city or university is part of. That's my controversial... So that's quite, so that's quite interesting because we've been going around doing some of these briefing events and you are an arts and humanities academic and you don't sound like you're afraid of this at all. So some people, I think, find this uncomfortable, this focus on impact and on working with businesses or cultural organisations within the city for impact? I think it depends on... I mean, my, I am an artist, so I'm a circus and fairground historian of 19th century entertainment. So in a way, I bring to that the whole history of illegitimate entertainment becoming industrialised. So how does a, a strolling player become a company? How does an artist become a world leader and inventor of circus? Creative companies have always gone through what I call the illegitimization and then the industrialization. It's just that nobody's ever thought of us in that way. So I applied that for seven years working with Blackpool. And how do I learn that? Because I got it beaten through me by working with the largest entertainment companies in the world. Merlin, uh, Band of Two Swords, Pleasure Beach, who basically said, this doesn't mean anything to us unless we can actually get people through the door and do great production. So having that apprenticeship in that industrial setting of a very, very commercially led creative industry was what, how I learned to understand that I did have value because I taught them that their heritage was their greatest asset. They didn't realise they had a heritage. They didn't think performing industries had a heritage. They thought only Shakespeare mm. had a heritage. So I think it's how you turn it around. Uh, you know, my, my city of Sheffield doesn't have that heritage, but I go to it and instead of thinking, all right, I want to do a great circus city, because that would be Bristol for me, or Blackpool, I'd look at Sheffield and go, well, what are its strengths? And I think really, as a university, you've got to think, what are the strengths of the city or the region, and what are your strengths as a university? And that's the ideal, you know, menage a trois rather than marriage. Far too conventional. So that's, uh, Chris, that <laughs> sounds like territory that actually would be quite familiar to you in the way, which is in textiles and relationship to, to, to fashion design, which you can expand on. But, but in textiles, that it, the opportunity is around, around heritage and the, some of the things that are going on in cities that, where this was economically important and can be in the future. Yes, um, I should perhaps give some context. I, I think I'm the only technologist up on the stage. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. I hope to do as well. Um, my background as a chemist, um, I went into textile technology. Um, I was at Manchester for 20 years and then went to the great enemy, which was Leeds. Um, and was welcome. Um, the, the school I'm in was created in 2000 and it brought together textile industries and design and fashion. And they were thrown together to create the School of Design. And there were pressures within that system that um, never fully addressed. It was how do you get mainstream technologists who were into manufacturing, working with art and design, fashion and design, textile design, and to actually make a success of it. There's an academic success, do you get the bums on the seats, the students coming along? But as a brand, how do you make it world beating? And I think th this really addresses this particular um, initiative is it's the investment at that interface um, to get people, designers and technologists, talking together actually working together and taking on the big challenges, the big global challenges. Leeds and the Yorkshire region, big manufacturing, it has maintained its, its woolen high-end production uh, for fashion and design. 
non-wovens, technical textiles, where I think this initiative is really exciting, is that it's getting the, the big picture in textiles, in fashion, and trying to develop new concepts, new industries. And I think that, that's part of it to me, is how do you take things like digital printing, which is part of the future, how do you make that relevant to textile manufacturing, not just in the usual ways that you think of low water usage, it's relatively fast, it's getting faster and faster. How do you actually put that to the, the designers in their palette and say, this is what can be done? So a simple thing like, um, you print an image of an orange. It looks like an orange, it feels like an orange, it smells like an orange. Now, designers generally don't actually know that that, that could be available. It's then the difficulty of how do you get the technologies to deliver that. And I think what excites me about this is that we have an opportunity to take traditional industries in textiles and make new industries, new concepts and new sustainable design. Um, and that's where I think Leeds City Region and York in <coughs> general has the, the opportunity to really make a big difference. So, what we've had, so we've gone from illegitimate entertainment um, into new industry, or into, into becoming an industry. New industries, you can't get much nearer than uh, XR, because we've only this week decided to call it that. Um, does this make sense as a, you know, it, it, from your point of view, you know, we see the economic development partners as, as, as really key players in this, because if the partnerships that are put forward aren't aligned with what you're trying to do and what you yeah. see as the strength. So, so how do we make? How does it seem from your point of view, and how do we um, sh help shape those conversations? Well, the, well, I think the the first thing is the is alignment with our strategic economic plan. So, within the, the other regions that are represented to, here today, it's really important to look at the strategic economic plan for your area and to make sure that your ideas um, align to that. Particularly in the northeast, we've got a big focus on digital. So you know that's what one area would be really, really keen to um, work with partners in, in developing ideas around. Um, another point you will like to make really is this word ecosystem, because I think that that's really, really important. And um, clusters only exist and thrive within a within an ecosystem. In fact, they are an ecosystem in in, in themselves. There's some really great stuff happening within the northeast at the moment. We've got um, you know, the Northeast um, Cultural Partnership, the Creative Fuse programme that's going on. We've got great institutions like Campus North Digital Union that we've heard, heard of today. So again, that concept of actually building on what's all, already there and making it better and enhancing it to, the, to really grow the, grow the cluster, I think is really, really important. And um, the, the other thing, and just thinking about the I suppose the other opportunities are where this, where this um, may lead. I think there's, there's other, I suppose, policy um, objectives that, could, that probably are driven from different parts of industrial strategy and the, the local um, strategic economic plans so who have got particular focus on scale. Up. Um, when we look at the, particularly the creative um, sector, we probably, there's probably a trend where a lot of companies are probably scaled to, and this is an overgeneralisation, so... Um, Please excuse it, but they're probably scaled to say one, two million, but then plateau. Very, very few actually, you know, go beyond that and maybe break three million. So, you know, that's potentially a challenge economically. Or how can we support more companies to, to break that? Um, and then the other thing is the whole productivity challenge. So, looking at industrial strategy, there's there's one thing is about actually how do we get more companies growing, but then there's a long tail of companies who who. Um, I suppose underperform in terms of productivity and um, delivery. So, how can how can we um, within the within the cluster actually grow productivity? That's where you mentioned business models earlier. Mm -hmm. Are there different business models that are more scalable, more productive that could be could be applied and, and looked at that maybe aren't as labour labour as intensive as um, as we would like to think? And then there's other things like the you know the freelance nature of the the, the um, the sector and actually how could we you know really get that far in the north or southern so this it sounds like you're, you're up for it and it makes it makes total sense with what you're 
Absolutely. There's one, one other thing, and I, I think it's, it'll be equally important, so I'm not sure if this fits within your funding parameters, but, but one thing that, that's particularly exciting is actually how this transfers into different clusters. So one of the things was uh, you had a picture of an electric vehicle, mm. you know, um, bolt on the screen a bit earlier. The, the move in automotive to electric vehicles is going to open up a market for onboard um, entertainment. You know, that's something that we know is going to, going to happen. So, again, how, how, how can the, the creative sector interact with other, other clusters to develop opportunities and over to market, market opportunity? The, the, other, the other thing there, however, is that and it's all around this long term of productivity um, improvement. Actually, what, what we know is a key driver for productivity improvement is the adoption of digital technology. So can the digital sector kind of be part of the solution a bit more broadly? And sorry, and my final point is around the innovation because um, again, when we look at companies who are scalable, um, companies who actually outperform other, other, other the, I suppose the, the vast majority of other, other companies within their sector, that, that tends to be driven by innovation. What underpins innovation? It tends to be a culture of creativity. So again, can you be potentially be a solution mm. to addressing some of the challenges faced by others? I think I think that's, that last is a really interesting point because I can also I found getting involved with this and with you know, kind of innovation policy is that in most sectors um, it seems like the assumption is new ideas are hard to come by. And the thing with the creative sector is we make stuff up all the time. That's not the problem. Our problem is turning it into money um, often. Um, I just want to pick up on that point about cars, because um, somebody, um, and, and um, John, this is about something for you. <clears throat> once, we start, once we don't have to drive the damn things anymore, it's all going to be in the hands of you guys, isn't it? I mean, the experience of being in the vehicle. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's all down to the UI and UX and all that sort of more acronyms. Um, I'm sure everyone kind of gets them. Um, yeah, but as uh, as Colin pointed out, people are going to need to be entertained, strangely enough within their vehicle. Um, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of um, really strong companies in this space. I mean, the Hedgehog Lab, uh, we, we've done some automotive stuff. We, we work with Nissan and Microsoft on a HoloLens development um, for, for the Nissan Leaf. Um, there's some great work being done by ZeroLite down on the key side, who do, do massive work with uh, Audi uh, within yep. the XR space. Um, I think they're currently across in Germany as we speak at the yeah. uh, CPU event. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a massive opportunity and the way I see it from, from you know, my neck of the woods if you like with Immersive uh, is that it, it's such a huge opportunity and we're kind of, we have it in our, um, almost in our DNA in the northeast with a, a, a kind of history of developing um, Early days, eight-bit entertainment uh, computer mm -hmm. games, basically yeah. from like 40 years ago onwards. Um, there's a, there's a, it's, it's in our DNA to build this stuff, uh, and if it's supported and, and channeled right, it's. Honestly, Herb's talk earlier on about having a, a big vision to be go to the moon type thing. Series I that if we play immersive right in this region, th this could be the new shipbuilding for us. That's how big it that's can be. The, well, that's, yeah, that's a huge. That's a huge vision. That really is resonant stuff. Yes. Can I can I just put a plug in for really what to me is a, the wider culture? Because I think in a moment it's becoming a bit of a tech fest. It's all about digital. I want to talk about storytelling and poetry and art and music because that's what makes a city worth living in. That's what makes a city worth writing. I love your tech boys. That's fantastic. But you need storytellers. You need designers. You need writers. You need people who are actually going to go into your buildings. Because at the moment, there's tech clubs all over the country, but where's the creative industries around them? Where are the I writers? Agree more. Um, so, you know, let's, let's think about the creative industries as the producers and the writers and the poets and the musicians and the people, because that's the sector that creates a vibrant economy. You know, it's the West End of London that brings the people in to come to London as much as the museums and the businesses. You know, but the Arts Council doesn't fund them. But who's the next, who's going to be the next people who are going to create the West End Theatre? Who are going to be the next people who are going to create the Booker Prize? Because those are the people who don't get funding anymore. And that's, to me, 
where universities, we're creating all these graduates who want to come out and change the world, but we're not giving them an economy to do it in. So that's just not take it all about tech. To me, digital is just one of many platforms. So that's, that's a, I, as I take it, so that's a thing to, you know, Sorry. <laughs> to really use this opportunity to try and show the vision that moves creative practice on one. Yeah, I think and so. Where, and where that moves. And I think, I, I, I guess, because for, for you to say in a way, that it's creative practice, and you've got a very clear idea of where you want to land that. Well, I would say, just taking your point, I mean, one of the projects of work with Hampton Court Palace, and it was on uh, medieval tapestries, uh, which was the, the sort of the bling of their time. And we did all the, the techie stuff, trying to understand the degradation and whatever. But the really, I'd say, interesting one, and uh, well worthwhile one, for the, the, uh, the cultural tourism industry down in London, was that we did a um, digitally ar archive the front of the tapestry, archive the, the back of it, and then, because the front had faded, we then projected the colour compensated image onto the front of the tapestry, so you could see the tapestry as it was 500 years ago when Henry VIII commissioned it. And it was a massive success. And to actually communicate the technology behind the, the dyeing, the manufacturing, in a, an effective, creative way, probably had more of an impact on the, the, the population and all the the geeky stuff we did in terms of understanding how the wool and the silk degraded. But just to go back, you mentioned the, the LEP and the engagement there. W one of the things that we, we've been successful in doing is looking to set up a, a 3D weaving innovation centre, which, is, which let's say, blow the trumpet, will certainly be the best in Europe. Um, it will I like that degree of certainty. Well, it, it, is, it, it isn't, I mean, it's like, I'll go for a cliche, it isn't that anyone can buy a Formula One racing car, anyone can drive it, but at Leeds we race the technology. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell that to the AMRC when I get back to Sheffield. Yeah. <laughs> well, as I say, we've talked to other people down at the AMRC, and, and part of this is, you mentioned the car. Oh, Yorkshire. Yep. With the, the 3D weaving, that is one of the, the obvious areas in terms of producing 3D woven composites for the automotive, for the aerospace, the big industries. Um, but the, the really interesting stuff is what you, can you do with it creatively in, in simpler things with aesthetics, that you can weave a glove in one piece without any stitching, honeycomb structures. And, and really push the technology and not just go down the, the straightforward expected routes. And I think that's where technology and design should be really pushing the boundaries. So this, I, you three all have, I think, from different perspectives, really clear ideas of what, what, where you could take this in terms of propositions. I'm just wondering about, I mean, I think one of the things we found going uh, doing these briefing events is... Um, there are quite a few challenges about doing this as well. So there's one challenge which is, which is kind of trying to arrive at a vision. And there's another challenge which is trying to set up the partnership to deliver it. So um, how, who would like to take on the how you do that bit? Or maybe how you don't do it from past experience? I, I, well, my colleagues over there say, don't say this, Vanessa, don't say how we do it. But I think it's important to look at asking what the partners want, really. And also having a slight benign dictatorship as well of what the vision is. So you do need that combination, because I do think, we, we did a whole thing in Sheffield last year, uh, where we learn, you, you actually learn, everyone in this room will have partners they've worked with, so they'll know who are the good, the bad and the ugly, and they'll know who are the ones that you have to work with. But really, it's just about dialogue, and we all know that. Or finding the common ground, even if it's just one thing. Sometimes, Having so much in common can be a problem because you compete. So having nothing in common is actually the glue that binds you together. Yeah, um, yeah speaking from our <coughs> sort of end of things, um, I, I hear your point about uh, you know tech geeks and all that kit and all that stuff, and I totally get that. Um, certainly at Hedgehog Lab and previously uh, with Vector, we have always worked with the, the, the creative, the arts and culture sector. Primarily, well not primarily, but one of the main reasons was they were the ones that were willing to take a risk early on and storytelling and yeah. all, all that stuff is massively important. And I, uh, I mentioned this in, in, in most of my other talks, which are a little bit more sort of tech targeted, if you like. 
um, basically point out that the kit is absolutely useless without creative ideas. You know, there's no point having an Oculus and Live and all that stuff. No point at all unless there's, there's, there's some really good content behind it. Um, so over the years, we've worked with people like, uh, it, well, locally, Isis Arts, Tyneside Cinema, uh, Culture Lab at Newcastle University, all sorts. Because they, they were the ones, and we're talking nearly 10 years ago, they were the ones willing to take a risk and say, you know, can we use that kind of weird VR thing to try and do X, Y, and Z? And uh, yeah, we'd, we'd like to think we did some pretty good work with that. But I mean, that's, again, a really interesting thing. We had a question for more about museums, and that's certainly hmm. my experience. We, we, you know, in my business, yeah. we've tried out loads of things we couldn't try on anybody else with museums yeah. um, to then develop kind of larger scale things that you can roll out in other sectors. So it's a, it's a really interesting kind of reminder for us that, that that's another role that the kind of the cultural sector play in terms of in terms of experimentation. But they're not for the R and D. They are businesses Absolutely. and they are. groups that are being fundamentally destroyed and cut by local authorities, by national bodies, and sometimes they don't have the resources. We also have to understand that. You know, in Sheffield recently, we had to pay for a museum curator for the archaeology collection uh, because they didn't have an archaeology curator because of cuts. So for one of our bids, we made sure that they were in that bid. So it is that desperate. I mean, in Lancashire, my home county, they've, cut, they've closed 11 museums last year. So you've got to understand the, the geographical sector. It's all like saying, fantastic, I want to work with this museum, but... They can't open more than four hours a day. So you, you have to understand their economic circumstances because they will see this money as money for them. And that's Are really... They no, they're not. And that's what I'm saying. But we've got to work out what that money can be used for. That, that's interesting, how it can be leveraged and how it can be used to benefit them because we want their economy, like you just very importantly said. A museum has a... A bit like... You know, for the, for the micro-economies of the creative industry, a museum or a design centre is the kind of factory of the 19th century where it might have employed 6,000 people, but there was another 3,000 jobs around it. Mm. So that's the same with museums. They might only employ 100 people or 50 people, but there's three or 400 jobs that rely on that interlinking. And I think that's the opportunity for this call to really understand the interlinking between those aspects. So not just necessarily the favourite coffee shop or the designers in the museum, but sometimes that's where the best ideas come from, isn't it? Yeah, really. So that, that I think leads us into the, to, to one of the questions we didn't get actually from before, is, is, is what can we use the funding for? Because one of the things in, in this call that's slightly certainly unusual from an NHRC call is that there is an anticipation that some of it can go directly to businesses. And by businesses, I mean... Um, not for profits, cultural organisations as well as as well as businesses. But then Herb set up the challenge right at the start in his keynote: is how how do we make sure it goes in the right place? I mean, that wasn't quite what he said. He was saying how do we make sure it doesn't get lost in the university system? But how do we do that? How do we incent? I mean, you're all used to working with businesses of various kinds. Colin, you're you know, is the lack you want businesses involved in in these kind of strategic how, how, do we, how do we do it? Has anybody got any good models for doing that, for making sure they draw businesses in? Um, so, okay. I mean, for, for me, it, it, it comes down to, and, and this is where you're going to judge it, it comes down to the, the quality and the ambition of the project. If you're working with industry, and I've been remarkably unsuccessful in getting money out of research councils, most of my money has come from industry. And they, they, they're not charities. They, they're expecting a return on their, their financial uh, investment. And um, I say women around the world thank me for my work I've done on hair straightening and um, minimising the damage Stunning. to work. Uh, I think the three of us are very yeah, good at that. I think, I think I'm not the best Everybody example, be. actually. <laughs> But as I say, the point is, is that they want a return on that. So I think in terms of where well, we'll be looking to um, develop the uh, proposal is looking at what are, the, what are their commercial challenges 
Um, how can you create a sustainable, say for fashion, sustainable design? I mean, one of the big challenges going forward is that um, what happens to second-hand clothing that goes from Europe and North America into Africa? It, it is, and um, that, that particular route is going to be stopped eventually, and we're going to have a tsunami of waste clothing that is going to be stuck in Europe, which is going to be a landfill, potential landfill issue. How do we reuse that material? How do we get designers and manufacturers to think in a different way? And of course, in all of this, for them, there has to be a profit. And that is where the, the credibility of the proposal and the engagement with industry and getting that much, much funding has got to be very broad and very effective. So, so, so you take, so prime thing for getting, um, putting the functions there is the quality of the vision at the heart of it. Um, anybody got any other, other thoughts that necessarily you have to do things? I, I, I would say just picking up on the point of vision, that's absolutely fundamental. You need a vision and a group of organisations who, you know, really care passionately about the achievement of that. That vision, that's, um, that's got to be at the heart of things. Um, I'd say if there are people who you feel aren't as passionate as you about that vision, then you've really got to challenge if they should be involved in the pro project because you'll end up having to really push them and you know, kind of drag them along for the ride rather than, than them, um, I suppose, really pushing and not adding value. But what sits below that, and, and obviously this is something you've been asked for in the bids, is the KPIs, you know, what, what exactly are you going to achieve? You've got to be really, really careful in actually developing those because I've seen it so many times where there's a really compelling vision, a group of people are really passionate about delivering it, but the KPIs actually get in the way. They compromise the achievement of that vision and, and because they haven't been designed in the wrong way, they can start to drive the wrong, the wrong type of behaviour from, from partners because you know, they've got to hit the, the KPIs to draw down the funding. So um, you know, just be really careful in, in how you develop your um, objectives. I think you said as well about um, different aspects of monitoring, and I agree, you know, we've all been involved or had grants, or we know of grants, where sometimes nothing happens and there's no penalty. And, and it's interesting, in industry, there is a kind of, you have to achieve metrics, you have to do certain things. Even the Arts Council now are starting putting in, you know, first year reports, second year, third year progress reports, and we have those with the HRC, we have them, but it's never, it's never measured on what you have to say in the report. So maybe better, I and mean, then I'm probably killing myself here, but maybe better scrutiny of, of deliverables, I think is a good thing. And maybe, um, you know, let's think outside the box. I mean, one of the things that I find really interesting about some projects that have been funded recently is this whole aspect of co-production, of the, is the artists and the people in the businesses who are the assessors, not always the academy, or not always the industry, and not always regionally biased. You know, so sometimes you get people from London who come up and assess, and they they they're measuring it. I mean, you said yourself, oh, you know, the SMEs, you need to think big. Well, in Sheffield, it's all SME. If we have SMEs, we're really lucky because it's in the creative industries, it's all microeconomies. So yeah. it's that scale. So sometimes be careful about language because. No, in London, SMEs, there's probably lots, but in other cities, the SMEs are the big companies. So what do you define an SME in creative industries? 50 to 500. Uh, yeah, which is a huge. Yeah, yeah, which is huge. So there is not an SME in my city which is 500, which is in the creative industries. Yeah, but, very few but I can also say the biggest employer of manufacturing in the city is 700. So we don't get judged on that. We don't get judged on that. And that's the AMRC, which is a university mm. HAE partnership. So that shows you how cities have changed so dramatically. Uh, and this is the Cutler's Company, the oldest Cutler's Company in the world, which is making <coughs> us, they're telling us that. So it's, it's an interesting challenge of understanding almost SMEs, microeconomy for the creative industries, shouldn't be judged on the same number as they are in the rest of the industries because the impact is more tangible and intangible around it. That's what I'm saying. Okay, um, we're standing between you and lunch, so I, 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 I will draw this together. So I think there's some really interesting 
ideas that are pushed out beyond what we're talking about now. So I think the one you, I think you all agree on is quality of vision is absolutely central to these things. So it isn't a box ticking exercise. This is about developing a vision, having the partners. I think the the reminder that the cultural partners and the cultural sector are risk takers. I think is is a one that I'm going to take back and slightly revise the way we talk about this because I think <clears throat> you've all suggested that everybody's got to remember that whoever your partners are, they've got to have a return on investment out of this. So nobody, nobody's, um, nobody's along, uh, along for the ride. I think, and, and then, perhaps on the other side, the idea that developing KPIs is not only important, but can get in the way. Uh, and that um, I think uh, the point I take home from uh, the last point Vanessa was making, which was an invitation to performance manage the partnerships, I think which might be controversial, but if we want impact, and for those who come from an industry background, that's the kind of thing that happens all the time, I think uh, that's, uh, that's a very uh, valuable contribution. So thank you very much to the panel. Um, I hope you'll continue conversations over lunch, and then we'll uh, meet to do the uh, technical brief on any technical questions uh, after lunch. Thanks very thank much. You.